You weren't pulling anything. Huh? Not enough. I don't Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Here. Pauls. Here. Palermo. Here. Festerson. Here. Harding. Here. Mr. President. Here. Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing today for our invocation by Council Member Rich Pauls. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon. We probably need to thank Abraham Lincoln because in another day or two we're going to have the day off of Thanksgiving. He created that day. It was established earlier, but he did make it a national holiday because during the Civil War he believed that we need to be have some uplifting spirits, which I hope your Thanksgiving is like that. Uh, a lot of people attribute the first Thanksgiving to uh, the pilgrims. And, uh, and at that Thanksgiving, they did have, which I hope most of you will have, they have fish and lobster. Turkey, not as much. But so it goes to show you in history, sometimes we rewrite history. In fact, if you really want to really rewrite history, you'd have to thank the Spanish. A uh, hundred years before that, <coughs> at St. Augustine in Florida, is when they actually had the first Thanksgiving. Uh, so sometimes uh, we do rewrite history. So let's make history today and not rewrite it, but make it today. Thank you. <laughs> An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting, and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white binder on the East Wall of Legislative Chambers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting of the Omaha City Council. The council thanks you all for being with us today. Now, as a courtesy to those in attendance, we would ask you to turn off or mute any of your electronic devices. Madam Clerk. Item 6, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for the Shire located northeast of 72nd Street and Silver Valley Road. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number 6 is today. Proponents, please. Oh, we're going to lay it over for two, two weeks. Motion to lay over for two weeks and continue the public hearing. There are no lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Items seven and eight relate to the same project and can be considered together for Ida Point North, located southwest of 180th and Ida Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item 7, a resolution to approve a waiver to the present development zone specifications of the urban development element of the City of Omaha Master Plan for this property. Item 8, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Ida Point North. Public hearing on agenda items number 7 and 8 are today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon. Joe Zadina with Lampernearson, Nearson, 14710 West Dodge, here on behalf of Elkhorn Public School Stands. Any questions on either of the two agenda items? Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Is there a motion or a discussion? Motion to approve items 7 and 8. There are no lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Items 7 and 8 are approved 7 to 0. Items 9 and 10 relate to the same project and can be considered together for Vistancia, located northwest of 204th and 4th Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item 9, a resolution to approve a waiver to the present development zone specifications of the urban development element of the City of Omaha Master Plan for this property. Item 10, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Vistancia with a waiver of Section 53-84D lot frontage. Public hearing on agenda items numbers 9 and 10 are today. Proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of Council, Brent Beller, 1144 West Center Road. With me today is Jeff Elliott, engineer of record. Uh, this is a preliminary plat and rezoning of a piece of property about 204th and 4th Street, uh, 125 acres in this first phase, 280 residential lots. Um, planning board, planning department, recommend approval. Appreciate uh, your consideration here for any questions. 
Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Approved. Moved and seconded to approve items 9 and 10. There are no lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Items 9 and 10 are approved 7 to 0. Item 11, an ordinance to rezone the properties located at 4256 and 4260 Miami Street and 4253 Corby Street from R435, or R435 District High Density to R4 District High Density. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing agenda item number 11 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Moved and seconded to approve item 11. No lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 11 is approved 7 to 0. Item 12, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the ACI-1 overlay district to incorporate into that district the property located at 3040 Cumming Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number 12 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Moved and seconded to approve item 12. No lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 12 is approved 7 to 0. Item 13, an ordinance to rezone the property located at 5010 South 50th Street from DR District to R4 District High Density. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number 13 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? Second, roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 13 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 14, an ordinance to rezone the properties located at 4339 Lake Street and 4143 Grant Street from R535 District to R5 District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing agenda item number 14 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Second, roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 14 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 15, an ordinance to approve a PUR redevelopment overlay district in R435 district high density located at 2306 South 39th Street and to approve the development plan, planning board, and planning department recommend approval. Public hearing agenda item number 15 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Second, roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. Item 15 is approved, 7 to 0. <coughs> Item 16, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the ACI-1 overlay district to incorporate into that district the property located at 555 North 30th Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing agenda item number 16 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Second, roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Falls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 16 is approved, 7 to 0. <coughs> Item 17, an application for an addition to Starsky's Class C liquor license located at 7812 F Street for an outdoor area approximately 40 feet by 36 feet to the south. A is communication from the chief building inspector regarding permits. B is a request to withdraw the application. Public hearing agenda item number 17 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Motion to deny. Second. Roll call. And this was a motion to deny. Motion to deny. Second. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Item 18, an application to consider a Class CK liquor license for Main Street Market located at 6207 Maple Street. Public hearing agenda item number 18 is today. Proponents, please. Uh, 
Taxman, oh, owner of Maple Name and address for the record, please. Oh, Ben Taxman, 6207 Maple Street. Brian Zerline, 8229 Miami Street. Alex Freeman, 8229 Miami Street. David Megan, 6004 Charles Street. Here to answer any questions, to answer any questions we might have? Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? <laughs> Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Uh, Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I just wanted to say uh, welcome to Benson. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with the spot, it's the former lot two. But several of us have been there for lunch, and it was really good. Uh, I want to congratulate you on a review you received recently, too, in the World Herald that was very positive. And when I saw those pictures, I was reminded that we have to go back sometime soon to have some more of that. That was uh, you did a very Thank nice you. job there. We welcome you to that spot. Um, anything you want to say about the new restaurant or how, your intentions with the liquor license today? Uh, <laughs> Name and address, please, for the record. Uh, Brian's running 8229 Main Street. I always really want to get in there to help with our customers. They've been asking for it. Use some for our catering as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, with that, I'll motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded to approve item 18. There are no lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 18 is approved 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you. Item 19, an application to consider a Class C liquor license for Barks and Brews located at 13730 P Street. <laughs> Public hearing agenda item number 19 is today. Proponents, please. Thank you. Julia Plucker, 2804 South 87th Avenue, here for the applicant, Danielle Hargens, who's also here today if you have any questions. Um, but we are, are here asking for the approval. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Hi, Steve Anderson, 4850 South, 137th Street. Thank you. And you're in support? I am in, I am in support. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing that public hearing is closed, I have to call on Mr. Paul. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> it, it's unusual. <laughs> It's unusual that you're coming uh, forth with a proposition such as this, especially when you have Mr. Anderson, which is known as Mr. Millard, supporting uh, this particular uh, project. Uh, do explain to us what this is all about. It seems a little bit unique. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's um, really one of the first one of its kind in Omaha. It's a doggy daycare not a grooming, not an overnight boarding place, but um, they are asking for a liquor license for the evenings. It's my understanding that they're going to have maybe some open dog play and you can grab a, grab a drink. They've been in contact with the health department. They're following all the proper rules and regulations, but it's kind of a, a neat and unique concept for the city, especially for those of us who have dogs. But I, I don't understand. I will board my dog there during the day Correct. and drink there at night? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And Danielle, if you want to talk a little yeah, bit about Daniel, where you got come the concept. Up and, yeah. and Daniel, your name and address for the record, please. Danielle Hargan, 717 South 113th Street in Omaha. Um, so the main concept is a, a doggy daycare during the day. Um, and then we have a separate bay. It's like a four-stall bay old automotive shop. Um, so the last bay will be an enclosed bar section. So anybody can come in and get a drink. Um, dogs will not be allowed inside the bar area but then there'll be a separate play section in the bar section, if that makes sense. Um, so you can get a drink and then you can come out and play with your dog while you drink and play with your dog. So you and your dog can both socialize because a lot of people, if they don't bring their dog during the day, they feel bad for going out and having a drink at night. And so this is where they can bring their dog and go have a drink as well. Um, and then with the health department, if you go back in to get a drink, you have to wash your hands. There's a whole bunch of rules for that. Um, get another drink, and then you can go back out to the play section. Uh, it sounds like I may have to buy a dog. Yeah, right? you better. Yeah. I don't need uh, I do like how you repurpose an open place because I think at one time I took my car there. Oh, yeah. yeah, it used to be like an automotive shop and a sign shop. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, 
Congratulations, and uh, like I say, if you have uh, Mr. Millard uh, there supporting you, it has to be pretty good. Move. Uh, motion to approve. Yes. Second. I'll have to second that for you, Mr. Paul. <laughs> there are no further lights. Roll call. <laughs> Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 19 is approved. Good luck. Thank zero. you. Items 20 and 21 can be considered together. Applications to consider Class C and E liquor licenses for the Jewel located at 1030 Capitol Avenue. A is communication from the Chief Building Inspector regarding permits for the outdoor area. Public hearing agenda items numbers 20 and 21 are today. Proponents, please. Julia Plucker, 2804 South 87th Avenue, here for the applicant. This is a great new uh, exciting restaurant bar in the Capitol District called the Jewel. Um, they will be ha having fine dining and jazz acts, and they tell me it's not just local, it's regional and national jazz acts will be coming in to perform there. So they're very excited about it. Uh, Tom Westfall and Brian McKenna are here to answer any more specific questions about the uh, venue. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Moved and seconded. Yeah, Thank you. it's uh, been moved to approve seconded proper permits. Uh, is there a second? Yes. Uh, moved and seconded to approve items uh, 20 and 21. There are no further lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Items 20 and 21 are approved. Seven to zero. Item 22, an application to consider a Class I liquor license for Archery Games Omaha, located at 11106 Q Street. Public hearing agenda item number 22 is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Your name and address for the record, please. Uh, 11106 Q Street. Name. name? Harvey Leslie. All right, Harvey. And you're just here to answer any questions we might have? Pretty much. Yes. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Uh, I have a light. I do have a light. Who's trying to get the light on? Oh, Mr. Pauls. Uh, it wasn't well, you took It's on now, okay? It's on, okay. okay. Uh, would you, uh, since this is another sort of unique place uh, in my district, what, what, what are you all about? Uh, well, uh, Archery Games is... Uh, it's sort of an archery arena in there, so we have a big white strip down the middle. Uh, two teams sort of battle each other with uh, actually real bows, but the arrows have big foam tips on them. So it's like a paintball, but with bow and arrows. And um, we also have a, a section of axe throwing in that particular business as well. So people can actually throw axes as well in there. Okay, that's... that's <laughs> uh, well, I noticed in your uh, business plan that you said you were going to limit it to three drinks. Yes, that, that's correct, because everything's pretty much booked on a, either a one-hour or two-hour uh, booking, so we're thinking three drinks per person per, per booking. We're going to, you know, that's what we're uh, going for. Okay. In that particular well, but will you monitor that, or is that just your... <coughs> that's just kind of what we want to do. Okay. Um, we also have big corporate events in there, so the same thing will go for them as well. Okay, thank you. I so move. Motion to approve items 22, uh, second roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 22 is approved, seven to zero. Item 23, an application to consider a Class I liquor license for grown folks located at 3713 North 24th Street. Public hearing agenda item number 23 is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon. I'm Grant Forsberg at 8902 Nicholas Street, and I'm here with George Robinson, the proponent of this, of this established kind of another unique arrangement where I look at it as more of an entrepreneurial zone, trying to encourage some local chefs to come in and provide food for for those that will come enjoy it, and we're just asking for a license to help uh, allow the chef, him as the owner, to serve alcohol in conjunction with these events. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? <coughs> Q 
Shirley McFall, 2205 Pratt Street. And you're, you're opposed? Yes. Okay, and your opposition is? We have more than enough um, establishments in our area that have liquor license. Our area is known to be uh, overrun with drug dealing and prostitutes. Where this establishment is, it's right off of the corner on 24th and Pratt, and we have a major issue up there. We're just now kind of getting it cleaned up, and I understand that this is going to be a restaurant of some sort, but typically it starts off being okay, and then it turns into just a big fiasco. We just don't want any more liquor establishments in our neighborhood. Within five blocks, there's already four places that serve alcohol, and we just feel that's enough. Now, you do realize this is an eye, so that the only consumption is on site. There's no off-site. Well, yeah, I understand that, but it always starts small, and we've been battling this. These things start small, and then they just escalate. People will start hanging out on the outside, and then it just becomes a big problem. Okay. All right. Um, uh, okay, thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing the uh, public hearing is closed. Um, I'd like for you, uh, if you could, for me, just, I, I wanted you to lay out a little bit because we've had a conversation about what you propose to do with the site, and uh, I just wanted you to give you a little bit of background. I wanted you to give the, give us a little bit of background on what it is you want to do, because I, I do think it is kind of unique. All right, George Robinson, 5416 Ida Street. Um, what this is, this is basically going to be a social and networking spot, basically Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, and what it will what, what I'm attempting to do is if you see social media and you see a lot of entrepreneurs, chefs, and they're advertising food, selling food, what, the ones that don't have a brick and mortar or a um, food truck, this will allow them to come in there on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, build a base, cater their food, build a base in order to establish capital in order to go out and get a brick and mortar or a food truck. Won't be open. Pretty much not going to open Monday through Thursday, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with designated hours. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and your designated hours will be? Um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 12 p.m., 2 a.m. 12 p.m., 2 p.m. Um, 2 a.m. 2 a.m., you mean, yes, right? Yes. Okay, 12 p.m., 2 a.m. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted people to have an idea of what it is you wanted to do. We had a conversation, and I like the, I like the approach you're taking. The, the, the lady did have a point, though, about uh, congregation around that, around that area, especially around 24th and, and Pratt Street. The congregation, from what I've noticed so far since I've purchased the building, is pretty much from 24th and, I want to say, Manderson North, mm -hmm. not from 24th and Manderson to Pratt. Mm -hmm. Other than across the street, you have the Evans Tower who, and the Salvation Army who constantly have people coming and going. But other than that, there's no migration. There's only one building to the south, which is a barber shop. So. Okay. But I guess what I want to hear is that you are going to police the area around. Oh, you every most definitely. Okay. Most definitely. With All right. Thank you. That's security all I have. cameras to police the whole street within pretty much a block or two block radius. Security cameras? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. And there's no dance floor. It's not to be not no, to it's be not nothing like where you party spot at all. Right. It, okay. It's it's to encourage people to come and and present their their food and and their meals so they can hopefully develop into either whether it become a they want to move into more of a, a vehicle type restaurant. Yeah, I need to get your name and record and address <laughs> for the record again for you. Uh, Grant Forsberg at 9802 Nicholas Street. And Grant, you were saying? So it, it really is something to try to get uh, individuals to develop, either maybe in, even developing their menus yeah. further so they could support uh, either getting a vehicle to have a mobile restaurant or getting to the point where they can rent another place and open a restaurant. I look at this as a true entrepreneurial zone, and I couldn't find a better place to do that. When you have a, a place, if you had some other problems, we're trying to use this place to try to get more folks to, to find businesses to, to be more self-sustaining on, on whatever they want to do, whether it is a vehicle restaurant or a brick-and-mortar restaurant or whatever. This is not something that we're trying to open a bar. We want to make money by having parties and loud music. It's not what we're doing at all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for thank you for making that clear. Is there a motion? Second roll call. Jerem. No. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item twenty three is approved six to one.
Item 24, an application to consider a Class A liquor license for Rama Thai Restaurant located at 17903 Pierce Plaza. Public hearing agenda item number 24 is today. Proponents, please. Uh, Mr. Pres President, uh, Councilman, my name is Cynthia Epstein, 11516 Nicholas Street. I represent uh, Ramdas LLC, which is a, a uh, company doing business as the Rama Thai Restaurant located at 17903 Pierce Plaza. They're taking over the, formerly, uh, the premises of a formerly um, Asian restaurant called Formosa Zen that did have a liquor license, and basically they also have a temporary operating permit from the other liquor license. Um, and I do have the president, uh, Preeta Joy saying here, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Second. Moved and seconded to approve item 24. There are no lights. Roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 24 is approved 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 25, an application to consider a Class D liquor license for Jack's Discount Tobacco and Liquor located at 721 North 120th Street. Public hearing agenda item number 25 is today. Proponents, please. Hello. My name is Max Mirza. I have 721 North 120th Street, Jackson Brothers. I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you. Are yes. there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Moving and seconded to approve item 25. No lights. Roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 25 is approved 7 to 0. Thank you all so much. Item 26, an application to consider a Class D liquor license for Everest Gas Mart located at 5188 Leavenworth Street. A is an agreement regarding conditions dated May 1st, 2017. B is communications in opposition. C is communications in support. Public hearing agenda item number 26 is today. Proponents, please. Good morning, Councilman. Frank Eunice of the firm Hein Eunice, 6919 Dodge Street here. Also present with me is Netra Garung, the owner and operator of the Everest Gas Mart. Here to answer any questions, and we'd like to make a statement if we have opportunity. Did you want to make it now? Sure, Your Honor. Please. Um, so... Councilman, what we're trying to do today is upgrade uh, Mr. Garung's liquor license from a, a Class B license to a Class D license so he can sell spirits and liquor. He's been operating his gas station at that location for a couple of years now successfully. The un only people that work there are him and his wife. They have no employees. They run a very clean store. Um, they don't sell any single bottles. They're trying to make a living, and that's why they're asking for this upgrade of their license. Um, we do know that the Dundee Memorial Park neighborhood is opposing the upgrade of the license. Um, the Exarbon Elmwood Neighborhood Association is not, um, has not opposed it, as far as we can tell. Um, we've submitted to you, prior to this hearing, a petition signed by a couple hundred people um, supporting the upgrade of the license. What he wants to be able to do is not sell shooters or promote bad business, but to make a living by providing the people in his neighborhood the convenience of not having to drive, at, you know, five or six blocks out of the neighborhood um, to get their liquor from the grocery store or the quick trip down the street. Um, he's operated a good business. He has not had any nuisance complaints uh, to date. So with that, we'd ask that you Grant has upgraded council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Mr. President, Council, my name is Jen Bauer. I'm the president of the Xarban Elbin Park Neighborhood Association and a resident, 5501 Leavenworth Street. We are opposed to this. I have sent a letter through my secretary to each of you. Uh, I would assume that you've received it. Are there any questions from our side? No, no. If, the, if there is, they'll, well, after the public hearing, they'll, they'll call you up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard?
Uh, my name is Dave Schenzel, 319 South 50th Avenue. I'm here on behalf of Dundee Memorial Park Association. Um, I'll make this real quick so then you can, if you have questions, you can ask later. Um, we see this as a pretty cut and dry issue. Last year, uh, first of all, I want to clarify, Mr. Garung has not been in business several years. He's been in business one year. He came before this council last year asking for a Class B license. We had some reluctance about that because this location has been an issue in our neighborhood for decades. And we are very concerned that that type of operation is hindering what could be future development on Leavenworth Street at 52nd. We did enter into an agreement with Mr. Garoom last year in May. He willingly signed it. We gave him everything that he asked us for. He asked for a Class B license and not to sell single cans. We put some other restrictions on that agreement. There were 12 of them in all. The second one was that he would not try to get an upgrade in his license. That is what we're doing today. Our board considers that a violation of that agreement. Now at the city council hearing last year, Councilman Jerem added a condition 13, which Mr. Garoon willingly accepted. That condition was if he violated any of the other 12, including number two, he would be found in violation of the good neighbor ordinance. We ask that that be enforced. This has been a very <coughs> troubling location for many years. It has not had liquor sales for 10 years. The last time they had a liquor license for Class D was in 2008. So it's been 10 years since there's been any of that type of sale. We ask that the original agreement be enforced and followed. We, are, we have lived up to everything that we were asked to do. Now we ask that Mr. Garoon live up to his part that he agreed to do just last year. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Mr. Jerem. Yes. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is, is that, and I've said it several times on these different licenses, is when you give your word, and your word is really all you have as, as an individual and as a business owner, and you made a a deal that was for me a contract with the neighborhood and it was only as good as you're willing to abide by your end of the bargain and the neighborhood agreeing to abide by their end of the bargain and the neighborhood as a whole is still as you can see suffering from the wounds of many years of some pretty dramatic issues at that location including a murder so I, I hope you understand why there's the opposition that there is. From another perspective, there has been a re rebirth of the neighborhood, so to speak, whether it was the building to the south with the J. Coco and the Legends Comics and Coffee to the new apartment complex to the east or the, the rehab of, of, of a building. I think it 51st or 51st Avenue in Leavenworth that the P.J. Morgan Company did recently. Those things were happening for a reason. They're happening because the neighborhood has healed and recovered sufficiently by the, the actions that we've all taken together that now reinvestment is occurring. You now see people with their families out and about walking to the businesses and um, I'm over in that area every day. I go through there on my way to my office. I go home that way. I, I go to the Maxi Walker right there. So I see your business all the time. So when I saw your petitions, 
I was really curious, well, how could there be such a remarkable uh, conversion story for the neighborhood in terms of now going back on what had just happened a year ago in terms of the agreement that they made with you. And something funny happened is when I got your petitions out, there was not one address associated with any of the names on the petition. So I started looking for names in vain to see if I recognized any names. And, and by coincidence, there was a name of a formal, former police chief, but I don't think it was, it's just someone with the same name. But other than that one name, I didn't, I really couldn't find what I would call neighborhood names. So I, I think you, you made a deal and your, your credibility in terms of your application is an issue for me. Um, the city legals told me that, that, that condition number 13 uh, probably today isn't the direction that they wish this to go, that it be more based upon the agreement that you made. And so I'm willing to, to follow the recommendations of the city attorney's office in that regard because there are lawyers and, and uh, generally I want to heed their advice when I find it sound. And so in this regard, I don't think that I'm willing to support the upgrade. And I know, in fact, I'm not. So um, I'll be supporting the neighborhoods on their end of the deal and the bargain that was struck, mindful how difficult it was for them to support your application in the first place. And the internal debate that they had over a prolonged period of time to reach the consensus that they did to take a chance on you. And so um, that's where I stand, and that's how I'll be voting today. It will be to, to deny the upgrade. But I want to let you know where I, where I stood on it. And I didn't have any questions for you. Thank you. Are there any other? There, there are no more lights. Is there a motion? Motion to deny the upgrade. Councilman, permission to be heard. Frank Eunice, 6919 Dodge Street. Well, the public hearing is over now. Thank you. If someone calls and asks you, if someone wants to ask you a question, they can ask you a question. Uh, if someone wants to do that. Uh, Mr. Palermo. President, I just had one question as far as the petition as well uh, for you, sir. Um, there is just names and numbers on here. I tried to call a couple of them. I couldn't get through to anybody, but that's, I mean, that is what it is. How many of these names on here are actually maybe of legal drinking age? Uh, so, um, my name is Nate Tragurum, um, and uh, Everest Gas Mart, 5188 North. Um, that's all 21 A's more than that. And some people are senior people who lives uh, the tower, you know, and and they wanted to have a wine, you know, and they don't want to, you know, walk all the way to the QT and bakers. So this they asked me to sign, you know, so they all they already signed the paper. But those people who signed that, that's all about all neighborhood people. I didn't ask anybody who live far from that place, you know. So. So, and they are so happy because, you know, their, their gas station was abundant, you know, so dark. I made a little bit bright in everywhere, you know, and they are so happy. So they wanted to, and now they believe me, you know, and so I'm so familiar with those people. That's why, you know, like they wanted to have, a, you know, like a, they're all hard worker people. They work all day, you know, and they wanted to get their things, you know, before go home, you know, so. I apply for that you know, liquor license, and the other thing is, uh, I I you know like <clears throat> I hope you know like, I was hoping all the time that I wanted to make happy in this neighborhood you know um, before you know like uh, the for liquor license you know like before I had uh, only beer, and I was thinking that if I you know like uh, make them happy you know and and more secure those people, maybe I have more chance to get you know the build up my business you know that's why that's why my goal was. And I'm a family man, you know, and the, uh, this is run by the family. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, there are no more lights. Is there a motion? Well, there is a motion to deny, and there's a second. Is there a second? Yeah, there is a second. You seconded it. Uh, motion to deny and a second. No more lights. Uh, roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0.
<coughs> item 27, an application for an addition to Omaha Tap House's Class I liquor license located at 579-583 North 155th Plaza for an outdoor area approximately 51 feet by 26 feet to the west, A's communication and support, B's communication opposition. Public hearing agenda item number 27 is today. Proponents, please. Hi, Naomi Burke, uh, 17142 L Street, Omaha, uh, Omaha Tap House, here to answer any questions. Thank you. Brian Musser, 16123 Parker Street, Omaha, Nebraska, here to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Ms. Melton. Uh, uh, Ms. Burke, could you come back up? Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You know, I just, I, I only received, I received one email that was um, opposed to, to this, and I'll make it a part of the record if it's not. We have it. You yep. have it? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were concerned about family housing within yards, although the person lives two blocks away. But are you going to be having live music out there that would at all impact the neighbors? What, what is your plans for the outdoor area? I'm going to let uh, Brian answer yeah. that if that's okay. Yeah, I, I actually run the location. Um, we have no plans for outdoor entertainment. Uh, we're just trying to uh, allow outdoor seating. Uh, we may, uh, right now we don't even have uh, access to our in-house music outside. We hope to achieve that uh, uh, coming next spring, but at this time we don't even have that. Uh, no plans for live music for sure. Okay, so, so you're just having a place where people can eat outside or have their drink outside? Yes, ma'am. All right, so in, you know, in the event that the music gets loud, obviously you have a number that somebody could call, reach you. And, and you also know that the law committee could call you in if they get too many noise complaints on regard yeah, to your good, the good neighbor ordinance. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I'd li I feel like we're supported pretty well in the neighborhood. It's actually kind of uh, a little bit surprising that somebody opposed it. Um, I, I, I feel pretty strongly about our presence in the neighborhood and the support that we are given. No, you, I think you've been a great place. I've never heard any complaints. and. I think it's great that you're expanding and you can allow people the opportunity to be outside. We just want to make sure that it wasn't for the purpose of, you know, we're going to have live bands and then I start getting the calls. Yeah. So. Our, our hours are not conducive to the, the partying type of atmosphere. We serve some great products, but with your meal. Okay. So. All right. Good. Thank you. With that, I'll motion to approve. Thank you. Moved and seconded to approve item number 27. There are no more lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Halls, yes. Palermo, yes. Festerson, yes. Harding, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 27 is approved, seven to zero. Thank you. Item 28, an application to consider an entertainment district permit for the Exarban Entertainment District located east of 67th Street, north of Francis Street, and north of Shirley Street. Public hearing agenda item number 28 is today. Proponents, please. Mr. President, members of the council, City staff, I'm Jay Noddle with Noddle Companies, 2285 South 67th Street in Exarban Village. Uh, we're here today to talk about the entertainment district designation for the inner rail, which is a special space that's been created within Zone 6 of Exarban Village, which is the block um, that is just now uh, reaching completion of the first phases, and that first phase includes the new world headquarters uh, for HDR, as well as the first increment of parking and the first piece of this inner rail space. Since we began planning Exarban Village, we always felt that Zone 6 um, would be the, um, the very special space within the village and the block within the village that housed the most density. Um, and fortunately, those desires have, have come true. Um, and so this inner rail space um, was created so that space that is normally not utilized, the space between a building and a parking structure that becomes an alley that um, doesn't really add anything to the block or the development, um, we created this so that it could be used and could be a very active space. The image you have on your screen right now um, is from the north looking to the south. The HDR building is on the right-hand side, and just beyond the HDR building to the right is 67th Street. The first phases of the garage structure 
um, are on the left, and this area in the middle is the inner rail that is about 50 feet wide. We've seen a space like this in other communities. We've seen it uh, in Ann Arbor. We've seen it in Bethesda. We've seen it in San Francisco. And when designed holistically, um, you can create a very special confined space um, that can present some really neat opportunities for dining and a little bit of entertainment. That's the path we've followed here. Um, we've been meeting with different departments within the city, um, particularly planning and the police department, who have been really great in talking to, the, to us about the lessons they've learned from the other entertainment district that was created uh, at the Capitol District, some do's and don'ts. And um, you know, whenever there is something new that's been done, there are some lessons learned. Um, and you try to build from that. You try to understand what they are and, and do something that um, maybe is a little bit better. Um, so there's a couple things that I think are really important. The first is this project is owned by a novel company's affiliate. We manage not only the, the, this block, but all of Ixarban Village, even though there are other owners. We are very concerned always about the quality of life in Ixarban Village and making sure that it is a safe and friendly environment. So far, after about a decade, I think we've been doing pretty well. Um, so our thoughts here are that um, with some of your feedback, we're very comfortable posting some signs, as long as we do them tastefully, um, that restrict the area where alcohol can be served or consumed. Um, we're comfortable using big planters that are very heavy, um, but movable, albeit movable, to confine the area where we need to. We are comfortable that um, music, outdoor music, when there is outdoor music, um, would be shut down very similar to what we do at Stinson Park. So it's either 10.30 or 11. I'm not quite sure that music is, is done. Um, we have set this up so there can be special events in this space. Um, and when there are special events in the space, anything that is required um, by the city, any kind of permits or, or whatever it might be for special events will absolutely be required by us. Nothing would be approved by us in terms of a special event unless the group holding that event um, had all the required permits and waivers and documentation and so forth. Uh, we're very proud of this. We think it's going to add an awful lot to Exarban Village um, and to the community. And, and the other thing I would say is the price point here um, is not the same as the other entertainment district in the city in terms of what we think the average ticket might be in one of the establishments there. It's a little bit higher. It's not. This is not designed for the college crowd. Yes, there are young people in Exarban Village. We all clearly know that, but I think that very quickly, if for no other reason than pricing and the balance of the crowd uh, or the patrons that may visit these establishments, I think we're going to kind of weed that out a little bit very quickly. Um, Todd Swarzik from my office is here. He will make a um, few more comments and walk you through some diagrams, and I'm certainly here to answer any questions. Um, we're hopeful for your approval today, and we're looking forward to opening the inner rail about the middle of 2019. Uh, Thank you. Any other promo, pro, pro, proponents who wish to be heard? Hello. Thank you. Todd Swarzak, Noddle Companies, 2285 South 67th Street. Uh, just to reiterate a few things that Jay had said, we, we really want to specifically thank Captain Hinchy and Vanessa Erbach from the Southwest Precinct. They've been very helpful with us. Uh, we brought them in very early, and we discussed any issues that they might have, um, talked through those, and uh, they were comfortable with our proposal. Also, the law and uh, planning committees within the city gave us favorable recommendations, so we thank them for that. Um, the security offices for all of Exarban Village are going to be housed at the base of the HDR building, so they will be adjacent to this space that Jay referred to as the inner rail. So the entertainment district is the overall uh, name of the project, but the inner rail is specifically what we are calling this area. It's an old horse racing term, uh, which is appropriate, I think, for Exarban Village. 
Um, <clears throat> so as Jay had also mentioned, uh, we are, our makeup of the tenants are going to be a little bit different than maybe other entertainment districts that exist right now. We are gearing toward a more restaurant and food oriented um, approach rather than bars. I think that's important. Um, our promotional association will sort of run the operations, uh, which includes the property owners make up that promotional association. We'll have input from some of the tenants, but the promotional association will be kind of the guiding force um, in that decision making and the promotional association will be in charge of putting on the special events will be in charge of uh, security for the area. There's already security throughout the Exarban area. Um, at times that we think there'll be higher traffic, potentially Fridays, Saturday nights, uh, we'll have additional security that will be walking through the area and monitoring everything. Uh, we also have bollards on the north side. One of the things that the police department had talked to us about was their fear of potentially a vehicle coming through, an unwanted vehicle coming through the site. And we've, we've, um, we've addressed that situation through bollards um, and also the planters that Jay referred to. So I think overall that we have a firm grip of what we're going to do here. I think it's gonna be a safe place. Uh, we have the world headquarters of HTR as a neighbor and they are right above us. So they'll be looking, looking on and they, you know, they're, they're um, in it with us to make this a successful and safe area. Um, so with that, I could answer any questions or. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? <clears throat> Mr. President, Council, Jen Bauer, 5501 Leavenworth. Here is the president of Xarban Elwood Park Neighborhood Association and a resident. Uh, I apologize to Todd, I owed you an email. We um, wholly support this endeavor. Uh, we feel that um, the inner rail is going to be a more grown up rendition of an entertainment district in Omaha. Uh, we don't have any concerns regarding the safety of our neighbors, any nuisance areas, uh, concerns. Um, we do understand that there's an increase in density in the area. We feel that um, Mr. Noddle has taken appropriate actions with planning for the safety in the inner rail, plus the traffic in the area has gone through engineering. Um, we don't see any issue with UNO. As he said, this is a higher price point. It's a more grown up um, entertainment district. So we, we support this endeavor. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Chris Wagner, 11620M Circle. I'm the executive director of Project Extra Mile. I uh, brought a written statement um, that I'll uh, provide you, but I'll do my best just to summarize it here in my comments today. Um, what I'd like to come here and tell you that you know Omaha and Nebraska have 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 improved with regard to the alcohol-related problems that we have. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. Omaha, we just learned this month that Omaha <clears throat> has uh, regressed from 27th worst binge drinking uh, city in the country to 25th worst. Uh, the state of Nebraska regressed from uh, the sixth worst binge drinking state in the country to the fifth worst. Um, we have 40, 436 alcohol attributable deaths um, as a state every year. Um, there are also significant economic costs associated with excessive alcohol consumption to the tune of $1.16 billion in 2010 alone. So there are a lot of, there's, a, there's another side to this coin. And I think a lot, of, a lot of times as a community and communities across the state are only hearing the economic development side of the story. So I, I just wanted to impress upon you um, that we do have significant problems. Uh, we're also the second worst uh, drunk or alcohol impaired driving state in the country. And, uh, you know, I've been told by highway safety officials in the state that Omaha is a major contributor to that problem as well. So 
things to take into consideration as you um, decide whether or not to move forward with this project. Um, I'd also like to note that over the past two and a half decades, we've made a lot of progress in terms of our underage drinking rates. Um, those actually have significantly declined by about 30% over that 25 year span. So we're moving in the right direction on, on that front. Um, and we're actually lower than the national averages on underage drinking, largely because we've been so successful in restricting our access to alcohol by youth. Um, so, you know, we, as, as an organization, we were here when the city decided to create these districts and we expressed our concerns. And then we were here last year as the capital district uh, put forward their proposal for a permit application. Um, and it, it just a, as a, for a cursory review of the, of the applications, it looked like um, the uh, Exarban Village application was based largely upon what was approved uh, by the council uh, with regard to the capital district. Um, so our, our concerns continue to be that, you know, there are the, the, the cups, the serving sizes of the alcohol are too large that can contribute to binge drinking and all the problems that come with it. Uh, we have concerns about the reliance on private security, which obviously don't, are not held to the same standard of training that uh, law enforcement officers are. Uh, we expressed a, a desire to have more resources dedicated to OPD to deal with any problems that would come from these entertainment districts. So those continue to be concerns that we, we would express again with regard to this application. I think the key thing for us is the absence of the wristbanding requirement. And I've heard today that there's a, it's a higher price point, um, it's not geared, it's not designed for the college crowd, but let's, let's note that uh, to the south, there is Baxter Arena, to the north, there's the Scott Campus. Uh, UNO has a, approximately an enrollment of 15,000 plus. Uh, at least a third of those are underage youth. Um, so just the close proximity of this to, the, to that campus is a major concern for us. And I think having, doing wristbands, wristbanding the adults is a small inconvenience uh, that as a community, as business members are a part of the community as the rest of us are as well, that it's a small inconvenience uh, to, to make sure that our youth are safe. So, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I, I, I feel like I know where this is going and I, you know, I would obviously urge you to, to vote to deny, but with the understanding that if you do decide to move forward with this project, that you'd um, consider amending the application or, or the permit to, to require wristbanding, um, just so that we're making sure our kids are, are safe as we can ensure. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard? My name is Larry Storr, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I'm not only opposed to Mr. Noddle's proposition here, but in general, this ever-expanding growth of these entertainment districts. Uh, his might be a little bit different. I think I heard a word, <coughs> I'm a little hard of hearing at times, a grown, this is more grown up for a more grown up crowd. Uh, but is it on private property? If it's for a more grown up crowd, either way, you know, maybe it should be an enclosed area unless it's a private courtyard that the public's not going to drive by. However, last year I was driving around to try to find out who, where all that loud music was coming from. I couldn't sit in my front yard and enjoy quiet street Lafayette without all this noise coming over the treetops. I thought it was next door. Well, I ended up being in Benson before I finally found the source of it. Benson's an entertainment district. But I could hear that music as if it was my backyard neighbor and I'm clear over on 50th and Lafayette. When I made phone calls the next day, uh, nobody had any idea what they could do about it, but they're all merchants on the same street and they all participated in that type of outdoor activity. Well, I also get noise from the football games uh, 
and various other places around that midtown area. So when we keep adding more and more of these entertainment districts, aren't we also going to have a problem with people having a little bit too much alcohol and maybe walking around where they shouldn't be? And maybe a do-gooder somewhere that says, hey, let's pick that guy and that girl up and take them into detention because they obviously have a problem. It's either a behavior problem, an alcohol problem, or a mental health problem. And as I understand it now under state law, you can do that. And even with minors, you don't need a parent's permission to pick them up. There might be a counselor riding in the police cruiser. So I think we're getting way out of hand on these things. And how many districts can you have before somebody starts going bust? And how many, how long will it be before one entertainment district is pitted against another? We're already pitted against the citizens. So let's think about it. I have to pay the taxes for the people you take in and detain and put in alcohol programs or juvenile detention programs. And then you want to not detain them. But excuse me, if they break the law, shouldn't they be detained? Yes, we need to help them. But we're not going to help them by making it more available. Think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, do the proponents wish any rebuttal time at all? About a minute or so. Thank you, Jay Noddle, 2285 South 67th Street. I guess I want to just clarify a couple things. First, we are only asking that this specific space within Exarban Village be designated as an entertainment district. Anything that anyone else might want to do in the village or anywhere else in the community as an entertainment district would require um, a separate application and separate reviews. We're just talking about this space. And then um, in terms of wristbands, it seems to me that first and foremost, the individual proprietors um, have a duty to make sure that those they're serving alcohol to are old enough and whatever means they use um, to do that um, really is on them. That is not something for us, I don't believe, to get in the middle of. They've got a lot at risk, whomever they are. Um, and the other thing is this is a place that's intended for lunch and dinner. Um, it's intended for people from all parts of the community to come and have dinner and maybe have a glass of wine with dinner. Um, and sit outside on a nice night. It's not a place where there's going to be a big screen and a football game. You're not going to see Thursday night football and Monday night football and those kinds of things in this space. You might see them inside one of the individual restaurants, but certainly not in the space. That can be, so those desires and needs can be served by the sports bars in the area who already do those sorts of things. So we'd like to keep it, um, we, we'd like to have your approval as applied for, um, and I'm certainly here to answer any questions or make decisions if I need to. Thank you, and with that, we'll close the public hearing. Mr. Jerem. Thank you. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Nile, if you'd come up. Uh, the first thing that I want to let you know is that the, the neighbors, the neighborhoods surrounding you are very supportive of what you're doing in the village and the concept as it's come into near completion in terms of the build out. Um, there were some questions that you addressed that a few people had and I would call them questions not opposition and that is um, if there is something going on that someone's concerned about would there be some posted mm -hmm. information as to who they could contact to have their questions or concerns addressed and I, I, I think I heard you say you were going to post a sign and that the security headquarters for Exarban Village is going to be located right there on site. So mm -hmm. um, you address that. In terms of the hours of operation, that was another question I had. People are familiar with Maha as the now two-day event in the summer that makes uh, about 5,000 fans very happy for a couple days until almost midnight. Um, and they were wondering, would this be something as, as similar to that? You answered that question, and, and 
Jen Bauer also said it's a it's a grown up place. It's dinner and drinks, no big screens, no big bands. Um, so people, I think, will be relieved to, uh, to hear what you said and confirm that. But one area that that I don't think your your development team quite understands yet, but will soon find out when you get to Lincoln and the Liquor Control Commission, is that there will be a requirement from the commission that there be some sort of barrier as a means to define the space where consumption is allowed and where it's not allowed. And traditionally, the commission has required some sort of fencing barrier. And so while I've seen very aesthetically pleasing planters and, and, and small trees, and that's nice. Uh, you need to understand, and I'm not going to design it for you, but the commission, I do fully expect, will require a design in of some sort of feature to prevent the, the sieve, so to speak, from people going in and out. Um, so be prepared for that when you get to Lincoln. Um, but I want to uh, give you a tip of the cap. Expect that it'll be professionally managed because of the space that it's in, the uniqueness of it, the significance of the HDR World Headquarters next door, and and uh, wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I'm supportive of as well. I think it's a good fit for this particular area and what you're trying to achieve in terms of its atmosphere and its density. And I had some of the similar questions that Councilman Jeremy already covered in terms of its practicality and its operations. but. I think that you have that handled or, or will when you come to um, speak with the commission as well. Um, and I also am encouraged that the security office is right there. Uh, I think that's a big deal as well as HDR itself, which is um, you know, a major um, um, presence there and in throughout our community and one I know that um, you'll be working with and would um, pose a lot of risk to anyone who doesn't do this well. So I, kn I know that won't be a, a situation you'll, you'll encounter. Um, my remaining questions are about phasing. Is this, it's contemplated there could be a phase two or a phase three. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. The, um, the plan for the block is to add two apartment structures on the northeast and southeast corners of the block, so over on 64th. So that really doesn't affect this, but that, um, that developer should be underway um, by mid-2019. And then Noddle Companies will work on two more office buildings, one directly north of the HDR building, which has always been contemplated, um, and one on the south side of the inner rail, kind of south of the garage um, on Francis Street, so um, <coughs> across the street from DLR and um, the Microsoft space. When we do that, um, particularly the, the building to the north of the HDR building. As that building gets developed and the parking structure is expanded to the north, then the inner rail space can be expanded further north. But we don't want to go beyond sort of the confines of the garage and the HDR building to begin with. Okay. So as additional development ensues, uh, this area could be expanded, but it, it would be a separate application back to City Council, or how would that work? No, it's part of this application. This is just the, what you see physically in place today is phase one. Um, certainly the planning department is very aware of the expansion plans, um, as is the planning board, and, and you all are, and the other departments. So as we go, um, we'll show our plans for the first floor of any additional structures. Um, both the office building and an expansion of the garage, and the idea is to kind of keep going to the north. Okay, and connected in that respect <coughs> geographically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate any additional applications in the uh, village itself? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I really don't know where there would be a, a space that's um, either in place or being created that would um, set up as well as this, or well enough, maybe I should say, for um, an uh, entertainment district designation. But we'll just we'll have to see what some of the other owners decide to do. But I haven't heard anything. And, and actually, I think for the neighborhood, um, when you consider there's more, a little bit of retail, not so much anymore, but a little bit of retail and more restaurants and entertainment coming, um, 
you know, we all work together pretty carefully in Exarban Village, and I don't know that um, a second area like this would necessarily be that much in demand or, or really that viable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I think when the City Council went about establishing entertainment districts, the two we did have con uh, contemplated or discussed at the time were the Capital District and Exarban Village as two areas where that would make sense. So um, I think this is consistent with that vision, too. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Harding. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, just a couple quick things. Um, I'm glad you brought up the point that this isn't necessarily just for alcohol. This is for food and, and entertainment and going to dinner and enjoying friends and family. Um, and that it's also important to, to note that those operators of those businesses that will be serving in the area have rules and regulations, be it food or alcohol, uh, to serve that they they need to abide by. But they're their uh, license could certainly be at risk if they're in, in violation. Um, the other thing I, I should have pointed out at the beginning is that I, I, I guess I'm um, really looking forward to this since in my day job I'm, I'm a daytime resident of the village and would, would really look forward to this amenity. And as was brought up with the um, security office being in, in the uh, base of the building, you are also a tenant and owner in the village. And in commercial real estate, when you're trying to sell a property to lease or, or to sell, it's always good to talk about that the, the landlord or the owner lives in the building. So I think those are all positive, and I look forward to this being approved. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pauls. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sort of angry with you, Mr. Noddle. <laughs> A number of years ago, I lived in that area, mm -hmm. and I sold my house, and I made a good money, really a good chunk of money out of it. And I just, it was just recently resold, and they doubled. So I'm angry that you didn't start this a little earlier in the game. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are no further lights. Is there a motion? Motion to Second. Move seconded to approve item 28. There are no further lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Paul, Palermo, yes. Festerson, yes. Harding, yes. Mr. President, yes. Melton. Okay. Um, item 28 is approved, 6 to 0. Thank you all and happy Thanksgiving. Consent agenda. Any member of the City Council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the City Council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed, unless otherwise provided by the City Council Rules of Order. Public hearing on agenda items numbers 29 through 32 were held on November 6, 2018. Moved and seconded to approve. No lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Mr. President, yes. items 29 through 32 are approved, 7 to 0. Public hearing on agenda items numbers 33 through 65 are today. If you wish to address the City Council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by your name, address, who you represent, and if you are a proponent or an opponent. And I think we're going to do it a little differently here in terms of it's up to you if you want to call them at all. Yeah, uh, no, we'll just we'll, we'll just vote on the. Uh, if it's okay with council members, we'll vote on the all of the manager applications, and then we'll go. You can okay. just vote on them all as part of the consent agenda. All of them as yep. part of the consent agenda. Okay. The motion. Someone to speak. Uh, someone to speak. I was just here on behalf of the manager application, so if you're going to vote, that's fine. Okay. That's smart. I'd like to have the manager come up and speak, though. You can, okay. call you can call any manager if you want to okay. speak. Because I have uh, from uh, 34, C and K. I have 34. Item 34. Yeah, they're coming over here. Okay. That's a rat. Oh, I see what's going on. Question. President, Council, Sarah Innes with Cohen and Kelly's. 13505 Marinda Street. Frank Vance, 11322 Francis Street, Omaha. May I ask a question? You can ask a question, Mr. Paul. Well, I didn't know how this. 
Uh, Frank, you own a couple of establishments. What's the other establishment? Uh, I think Dublin or Neil Market. Right. And, <laughs> okay. uh, and I know you're. Uh, I'd just like to have a little bit of a comment about Conan Kelly's. Uh, what is it like? I'd like to go there sometime. I just want to make sure I know what it's all about. Um, I like to refer to it as a high-class corner bar. It's like a like a Cheers, kind of a friendly place. You really should stop in sometime. Okay. It's, it's on 132nd Center behind Walgreens. Okay. So well lit. What's that? So well lit. Yeah. Is it well lit? <laughs> uh, yeah, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> and who's who's the new manager? Uh, this is Sarah Annis. She's been with us for seven years now. Okay. Well, thank you for coming down today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Festus. Thanks, Mr. President. I just wanted to note a few items on the consent agenda, because I think there are rep representatives here from them, uh, just in support of the Urban League, Rejuvenating Women, the Women's Center for Advancement, and Youth Emergency Services. I think uh, programs we all support and are in the budget, and we think have been very effective partnerships. Dealing with uh, homelessness and the 24-hour crisis line and youth attendance navigators in our schools, so uh, pleased to support that today. And then also just a word about the manager license since we're doing that a little bit different this time and this is the first time um, uh, we are now grouping just pure management changes on liquor licenses all together on consent agenda because they typically are not controversial but I do think it's important that the message is known that we still expect the managers to be here on those days in case there are questions or even razzing in this case um, as they come up so um, as a practice when we do have um, these on consent I think it's important this the, me the message is they are expected to be here in case there are questions or opposition to their applications. And we can always take it off consent. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, there are no more lights. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded to approve uh, items 33 through 65. No further lights. Roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Items 33 through 65 are approved 7 to 0. Item 66, resolution to approve the courtyard on Park Townhomes Tax Increment Financing Redevelopment Project Plan located at 1007 Park Avenue in an amount up to $584,778. Public hearing agenda item number 66 is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon, Don Seaton, Omaha City Planning. Uh, this is a, um, this TIF project is a townhome project. It's located at 1007 South Park Avenue. Um, this is a site right here. It's right next to the Hanscom Apartments. That was an earlier TIF project. Uh, it had uh, low-income housing tax credits in that, so that brought some affordable housing to the area. Um, it's basically this vacant site. There's a garage structure on it. Um, these are new construction for sale market rate townhomes. Twelve of them, they'll be uh, arranged in, um, in two buildings of six each. Also, I'd note uh, this is Leavenworth. We've got Mars or Mason here. The access is off the alley, which allows a lot of landscaping along South Park Avenue. So I get the name Park Courtyard on Park. Um, here's a nice drawing of the courtyard. This would be uh, Park Avenue courtyard between the between the units. All parking is on site. Each unit will have a two-car garage. Actually, they can fit three cars if they tandem park. Um, total cost of the project is about $3.6 million. Another rendering here. They're asking for $584,778,000 in TIF support. It's also a $15,000 voluntary TIF contribution from the Midtown Improvement Fund. The project complies with the city's master plan, meets the TIF program criteria. We ask for your approval. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Resident Gray, members of the council, good afternoon. David Levy, Baird Home Law Firm, 1700 Farnham Street, here on behalf of the applicant, Alex Jensen from the applicant courtyard on Park, is here with me as well, and just happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? <coughs> Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Mr. Jerem. Yes, Mr. Jensen, can you go out?
couldn't let your first time on your project uh, speaking on your <laughs> for your team go by without calling you up here and make you a little nervous anyway. Appreciate but it's it's not to really uh, challenge you in any way, but it's to thank you for your uh, father and your um, belief in the neighborhood, taking literally a hole in the ground on Park Avenue and turning it into something as magnificent as you are at significant cost. So um, I wish you success. Thank you for the investment, and I'm sure it'll be very successful. I mean, you're on a bike route. You're at the intersection of two mass transit routes. The decks you plan on building on the upper level will have spectacular views of the downtown, and, and um, I'm really looking forward to this one. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we close the public hearing. Is there a motion? Motion. Second. Moved and seconded to approve item 66. No further lights. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Paul. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 66 is approved 7 to 0. Item 67 through 78 are part of the legislative package for the first session of the 106th State of Nebraska Legislature and shall include. Item 67, to introduce a bill to create an Infrastructure Improvement and Replacement Assistance Act using state sales tax turnback to help cities and public utilities. Item 68, to introduce a bill to amend the state economic development assistance laws to allow Omaha to have a local option sales tax refund level payment plan each month similar to utility bills. Item 69, to introduce a bill to revise grand jury laws in the case of a person's death while interacting with police to allow the final report to be released only after any criminal charges are officially made and adjudicated. Item 70, to introduce legislation to change the penalty for witness, jury, or evidence tampering from a class four felony to a class two felony. Item 71, to introduce a bill to amend the Ground Emergency Medical Transportation Act to allow claims to be made as a certified public expenditure or CPE. Item 72, to introduce a bill to establish a registry of condominium officers with the county clerk's office for purposes of receiving official government notices and provide procedures. Item 73, to support legislation if introduced to change the state statute to amend the good time law to require more post-release monitoring in the form of probation or use of electronics. Item 74, to support a bill if introduced to create a turnback program to assist with the redevelopment of Tranquility Park. Item 75, to support legislation if introduced to help with mental health care assistance in the state of Nebraska to ease burden on police and local jails. Item 76, to support legislation if introduced to rewrite the state's mental health commitment laws. Item 77, to support legislation if introduced to expressly provide that online sales tax applies to all sales subject to state and local sales tax over a certain dollar amount and or number of transactions and assure that local option sales tax continues to go to each appropriate municipality. Item 78, to designate John A. Jack Chaloa as the official lobbyist of the City of Omaha. The public hearings on agenda items numbers 67 to 78 are today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is Jack Chaloha. I'm city lobbyist in the City Law Department. Um, appreciate being before you today uh, with the uh, state legislative program. It's kind of a culmination of almost a year's work where we come up with our state legislative agenda and place them before you in the form of resolutions. Today, as mentioned, there are uh, six items which would call for the introduction of new bills at the state legislature, and we, the city of Omaha, would take the lead on those uh, where the resolution calls for the, uh, the introduction. And then there's five items, if you will, that would call for support if some other uh, senator or an agency asked for the bill, we would be there to support it on um, your command here. Uh, finally, the last resolution gives me authority to represent the city before the state UNICAM and the governor's office and uh, also make requests to various city departments to give me uh, data and support as we push the state's legislative program. Uh, with that, I will just uh, try to answer any questions you might have, but uh, I appreciate your attention to this. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. I, I'm sorry. I've got one. Yeah, I'm to get up. Just relax. <coughs> Name is Larry Storr, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska. Specifically on number 75 and number 76, 
I believe I mentioned it earlier. At least I did this morning. Uh, I think it's fine that we're asking for help from the state legislature, but before we ask them or <coughs> tell them to rewrite legislation, we should uh, discuss how we want them to rewrite it and who's going to help them rewrite it, because we all know that most of the sitting senators, locally or state senators or federal senators, actually don't draft legislation themselves. They get input from uh, concerned citizens and organizations, <coughs> stakeholders, 501c3 organizations, private organizations, private corporations, uh, none of which I'm a part of. I'm just a citizen. But by some of these people's criteria, their checklist would indicate that because I speak out on these issues, I may have a mental health problem. And therefore, on the checklist, uh, six out of the ten items, hmm, that guy should have some help. But I do read that our state legislature, not necessarily you, now think that even in our schools, and as early as six months anymore, somebody else can help us determine that somebody has a problem and therefore they need help. And I think that is going against the Constitution. I agree and I support our police officers. So why should we ask them to help us solve those problems? Yes, we need more money for them to do that. But maybe you should back up and ask the various organizations and professionals in Omaha and the school systems. Why can't we solve these problems before they happen? Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents who wish to be heard? Uh, Luis Jimenez, 518 North 40th Street. I want to speak on 75, not necessarily, uh, I think it was necessarily uh, an opponent. Um, I've had experience with needing to go to the doctor and getting a mental health treatment. They oft I found that uh, for myself, I was prescribed medication, depression pills, and that only helped for three months. Uh, and that wasn't what, what the problem was with me. It was more to do with uh, my lifestyle and just relaxing and being um, taking care of myself more holistically. Uh, so if you're going to go to the legislator, this is fine. Have them do mental health care because there's assessments and there's uh, things that the uh, mental health providers do help with. However, if with looking at it as a city, in the city standpoint, there's so many things that we can do here to help with uh, mental health. And not it's not necessarily going to the doctor to see what's wrong with your head and then getting some uh, pills. The, 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 this country is heavily medicated prescriptions uh, up the wazoo and the doctors get paid to do these things. Uh, I've experienced that. Uh, so there are things that you guys can support here locally, programs that you can support locally that do contribute to the wholeness and complete holistic treatment of a person. But if you're just going to go to a mental health provider, they, uh, they do miss these things. Simple things, very simple things that eight years of college wasn't enough. Um, and I say this because of the frustration that I've personally uh, experienced. Uh, so taking care of the mind, mental health, is also to do with the person's body and what space is provided to people. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Mr. Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Jack, now it's my understanding uh, you want us to vote on the first uh, six, the ones that we are going to uh, introduce? Uh, yes, Jack Chala, City Lobbyist. Um, the first six items all call for the introduction of bills where we, the city, take lead and, 
and I, it'd be my preference to take individual votes on those so we could uh, utilize uh, your resolution as we uh, try to advance the bill down in Lincoln. Okay. And how do we want to proceed? Well, I guess we'll proceed with one after the other. We'll start okay. with 71. Is that right? Accurate? We'll start with 67. I mean, I'm sorry, 67. Yep. 67. I'm going to move this. Start with 67. And we'll move to approval on the first Second. six, one at a time? Yep, we'll do one. Okay. Yep, one is there a motion to approve? Motion for item 67? Is there a second? Moved and seconded to approve item 67. There are no further lights. Roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 67 is approved, 7 to 0. We can move on to 68. Motion. Moved and seconded to approve item 68. No lights, roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 68 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 69? Yes. Is there a motion? Second. Is there a second? Roll call. Uh, there is moved and seconded to move item 69. Roll call. Jerem? No. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? No. Item 69 is approved 5 to 2. Item 70. Is there a motion? Sec is there a second? Moved and seconded to approve item 70. No lights. Roll call. Jerem? No. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Palermo, yes. Festerson, yes. Harding, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 70 is approved, six to one. Item 71. Second. Moved and seconded to approve item 71. No lights, roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 71 is approved, seven to zero. And item 72. Is the motion? Most moved and seconded to approve item 72. No lights. Roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 72 is approved. 7 to 0. And we can take item 73 to 78 together. So moved. Second. Roll call. Jerem? Yes. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Item 79, in ordinance to approve the collective bargaining agreement for the years 2018, 2019, and 2020 with the Omaha City Employees Local 251, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFL-CIO, Personnel Board recommends approval. Public hearing agenda item number 79 is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Mark McQueen. I work with the law firm of Barrett Home. I've been negotiating contracts on behalf of the city of Omaha for approximately eight years now. Uh, Tim Young and I uh, led the city negotiations with Local 251. We reached agreement. Uh, that particular agreement I'd like to highlight very briefly for you and then I'll in entertain questions along with Mr. Young. Uh, it's important to note that in our previous contract negotiations, not this one, we, we started those negotiations in 2015 with the pension fund in horrible shape. Uh, at that particular time, the actuarial projections had the pension fund uh, scheduled to be insolvent in 22 years. By the time those negotiations finished uh, with the approval of the city, city council, uh, the <coughs> fund was projected to be fully funded in 25 years. It's a long time, but it's a big swing from being insolvent in 22 years to being fully funded in 25 years, at least at that point in time. And the, the, the manner in which we achieved that outcome was to establish what was then and remains currently an unprecedented cash balance pension plan for new hires, meaning employees who were hired after 2015. And we reduced the benefits and increased the contributions to the fund, uh, reduced the benefits for current employees. Now, why do I mention that? That's old news now, or three, three and a half years later. I mention that because the pension in these negotiations was not our top priority. What was the city's top priority going into this set of negotiations was health care. 
And some of you will remember my marching orders back in 2011 to try to negotiate a single health care plan that covered all uh, bargaining units in the city. The, the, the term we used back then was one city, one plan. Uh, that was a, an aggressive bargaining objective back then. Uh, remains so today, but we're a lot closer. As a result of these negotiations and some negotiations that preceded the local 251 negotiations, primarily with the rank and file police officers and the, and the management uh, of, of the police department. <clears throat> so with that background, here's what we're looking at today. This is a three-year agreement. It's scheduled to expire in December of 2020, which is just a little over two years from now. Uh, the reason I call it a three-year agreement is, is the, the, the most recent contract expired in 2000 and December of 2017, so we're 11 months into these uh, negotiations for various reasons. They took a long time. <clears throat> the primary reason for the lengthy negotiation this go-around was health care. Uh, Local 251 eventually agreed with the city's proposed health care plan. That is a high-deductible health care plan. Uh, it's uh, nearly identical to the plan that exists in the police department. Uh, I say nearly identical because in terms of city contributions to the employee's health savings account, which I'll describe more specifically here, we were a little bit more generous with the local 251 bargaining unit than we were with the uh, police department bargaining unit. <clears throat> but. Uh, the employees agreed to, to transition to the high deductible health care plan. They were willing to do so as early as 2019. For some logistical reasons and administrative reasons uh, limited to the city, that actual transition will take place in December 2000, or excuse me, January of 2020. So we're about, uh, about 13 months away from the actual transition, transition to the high deductible health plan. When that happens, uh, the employee premium contributions, their share of the, the total cost of the uh, high deductible health plan will increase from their current level, which is 7%, up to 10%. At the same time, their maximum out-of-pocket uh, costs will increase for single coverage from $1,000 annually up to $2,750 annually. And for the other two enrollment options, the single plus one enrollment option and the family option, uh, their out-of-pocket exposure increases from $2,000 to $5,500. Now that is a gigantic swing in potential personal exposure. We recognize that at the outset of the negotiations and we structured our proposal so as to protect the individual employees from that out-of-pocket exposure increase. How do we protect it? We protect it in the form of a <clears throat> lump sum city contribution into an individual health savings account for each employee. These are essentially like a bank account for employees that receive a one-time per year lump sum amount, uh, <clears throat> goes into their account, and can be used exclusively to pay for health care costs. So the idea is we increase your exposure at the same time to the extent you have increased exposure, we protect you from risk financially in the form of these health savings account contributions. It's similar to what exists today in terms of a flexible spending account. Those contributions go into the account and they can be used for, for medical purposes. The contributions go in on a tax-free basis if employees want to make contributions. Uh, they don't have to. They can make voluntary contributions, but as I mentioned, they're limited to uh, that, that account. Those funds in those accounts can only be used for medical expenses. And unlike a flexible spending account, it is not a use it or lose it scenario. Under a flexible spending account, you set aside money, you've got to use it in the ensuing year, or you lose it. Under a health savings account, that money can sit there until retirement and including during retirement can be used for medical expenses. So if employees manage their health care costs or, or preferably avoid additional health care costs, that bank account and that protection against future expenses will grow. Very significant change because now employees have a stake in how their monies get spent for health care. 
the, the philosophy or the thought process being <clears throat> they become better consumers for health care if that money being used to pay for their health care costs is actually in their own accounts. <clears throat> and for that reason, this is a uh, trend in the market, and this was a plan that was recommended not just for this particular bargaining unit, but as I mentioned earlier, for the police department as well. <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned, the increased exposure uh, offset by uh, health savings account contributions specifically for single coverage, the city makes an annual $1,750 contribution for those enrolled in single coverage. For those enrolled in the single plus one or family coverage, the, the city would make a $3,500 per year health savings account contribution. Uh, what would motivate Local 251 and the union to agree to, to those pretty significant health care terms, as you might expect, wages. Uh, so in, in exchange for the health care concessions made by the union, what the city did was essentially follow the same economic package that was used in the police department to secure their agreement with high deductible health care plan. That's 3% three, 3 per year in wages. That was the general increase. I say general because with Local 251, we did something very unlike what happened in the police department and frankly very unlikely, uh, unlike what we did with most other bargaining units over the last seven years, and that is we specifically examined the current wage rates for each job classification as compared to what the Commission of Industrial Relations might use for comparable cities if we were involved in a negotiation dispute and had the CIR resolve that dispute by ordering us to pay wages based on comparables. Local 251 did a wage study, CIR compliant wage study. We did our own less formal wage study, primarily through Tim Young and the HR department. And what came out of that discussion was some pretty uh, individualized, intensive negotiations, which led to some specific job classification wage increases, which were different than 3% per year. Uh, so in some cases, on the high end, certain job classifications got a 10% increase, for example, in year one. Other job classifications got less than a 3% increase in year one because of how they compared to the CIR comparable market. So we had 21 job classifications that received something other than a general 3% increase per year in each year of the, the, the three-year contract. In terms of uh, whether that falls within budget or not, Tim Young was in regular contact with the finance department and, and determining whether we were falling within uh, the, the money that had been set aside for budget. The answer was yes. Uh, in terms of specific back pay, you should know that we uh, agreed to retroactive back pay to March of 2018, not all the way back to contract expiration, in part because of some of these unique wage negotiations we needed to save money in a sense, so we didn't retro pay all the way back to the expiration of the previous contract. But in flat dollar amount terms, the, the extra wage costs in 2018 are 1.2 million for 2018. That increases to 2.7 million in 2019, and that increases to, to 4 million in 2020. I should note that in 2020, when we transition to the high deductible health plan, there will actually be health care savings as a result of that transition as well, and we have those monetized as well, and we can get specific if you're interested in that exact number projected. <clears throat> Last thing I would say about wages is the studies that were conducted by the union in connection with these negotiations and by the city were designed to focus on what the CIR would order if they examined a wage issue here. And what that means is they're not looking at local wages. They're looking at comparable cities in other jurisdictions. Uh, for example, maybe in Minnesota, or maybe in Wisconsin, or maybe in Colorado. That doesn't help with recruiting when you're sitting in Omaha, Nebraska, and you're trying to figure out how to, how to hire dispatchers, or engineers, or mechanics in Omaha, Nebraska. 
that's a function of what's our labor market look like, who are we competing with, how do we retain and attract current employees. Both the union and the city recognized that while it's helpful to have CIR comparable data as a reference point, because that's what's going to happen if we end up in a dispute before the CIR, it's likewise very important and very helpful to understand what the local market looks like. So the city agreed to further conduct a wage study on the, in the local market. And if we are deficient in the local market, we wrote language into the contract affording the city the right to adjust during the term of the contract, really to overcome some recruiting problems and retention problems that have become increasingly difficult to deal with in recent years as the job market has picked up. So that wage study is going to take place uh, over the next oh, 25 months, and it may require some adjustments midstream uh, in this contract if we determine that our wages are deficient and we can't attract or retain good employees. That was one of the commitments that we made. So what about pension? Um, on pension, we, we changed some language in the pension article to clean up an omission from the last contract that led to an arbitration. It doesn't have any impact at all on unfunded liability. It doesn't have any impact at all on benefits um, and contributions. Um, our belief, after the extremely dramatic changes in the last contract, was uh, it would be too much to, to go back to the employees so soon after the last contract and ask for additional pension reform whether that was additional pension contributions or additional pension cuts. And some of that belief was arrived at as a result of uh, communication with the, the actuary for the fund uh, who recommended since the changes that we negotiated were still relatively recent, 2015, uh, too soon to make judgments on what to do moving forward with that particular pension plan. We've got changes in place, particularly the cash balance pension fund for every employee hired after 2015, which will continue to reap benefits and continue to result in a positive impact on the unfunded liability. But because of those background factors, and, and I can get more specific for you in terms of concessions the union made back in 2015, because of that, we chose not to uh, try to try to make any more changes to the uh, pension benefit structure or contributions. Last thing I would mention, it was it's relatively incidental, also included as part of this economic package was a slight $25 annual increase in the uniform allowance for the sewer, sewer and street maintenance crew. I, I say incidental because at $25 and affecting only roughly five dozen employees in that neighborhood out of a bargaining unit of well over 600, uh, the cost uh, of that uniform concession is about $1,700 per year, pretty uh, insignificant amount in the overall scope of things. So that's the broad stroke summary. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them, and if I haven't addressed anything, I certainly want to fill in those gaps. The proponents who wish to be heard. Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Mr. Pauls. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> and you know this, uh, health has always been a concern of mine because uh, I had the, the opportunity when I was in the legislature as chair of banking, commerce, and insurance to find out why so many bankruptcies were occurring throughout the state of Nebraska. And guess what it was? Health care. So right now, uh, and I understand how the uh, union have voted on this. I'm just concerned, though, once we start messing around with people's health care pro uh, programs, uh, that we could be causing something in the future that we're, we're not may, we may not be aware of. Because you said we, 18, 19, and 20. What we're doing now starts in 20. The, the high deductible in 20, right? Correct. So 20 is going to be here like that. So after 20, 
what's going to happen? What do you project for the next? Will we still be contributing to the uh, to the individual's health plan? Is that up in the air? Is that a done deal? I'm just trying to figure out past the 20. Well, yeah, and it, it's a good question, but the fact of the matter is, like wages, uh, <coughs> like pension, like vacation, like holiday, every economic item is always open for negotiations. Uh, but what I would, what I would try to emphasize is, as you look forward, and I understand what you're saying, we don't want employees to be put in a position where they're in a financial crisis. And as a result of that, we very carefully protected the employees. Right. That's now. I understand it's a 20. But I, I'm concerned because I just heard you say you didn't deal with pension this year because you had just finished it in the past and we're not ready for it. One of these, are you telling me that in the very near future, the city is going to be in prob have a problem with health care, with pension, and retention? No, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that every negotiation that we approach, we have certain priorities that we have to deal with. And there are certain practical realities as you're trying to provide a wage right. and benefit package to employees to attract and retain employees and to be fair. Now, what we came up with in 2015 was an incredibly innovative solution with respect to pension. And whether we ever have to go back and renegotiate pension benefits, I don't have the slightest idea. I sure hope not. And that's exactly how the employees feel as well. But we've got to watch the unfunded liability. And if that, if that becomes a problem, we're going to have to responsibly manage that problem as we will this crisis in rising health care costs. Now, what we've done through this agreement right. is address that crisis in rising health care costs. With any contract, you are arriving at solutions for the duration of the contract. Right. You are not trying to predict what's going to happen after the expiration of that contract, and the facts and the developments will tell us at that time what is reasonable, what is appropriate, and what is fiscally necessary. Right. And I understand that. I do understand that. But by just listening the last year or two, pension has been a problem. You think we're on the right track, but you don't know. Health care, we're really redoing the, the health care plan, but we don't know. Salaries, 3%, uh, is because we we're giving that sort of as a incentive because we're taking some other things away. We just can't keep doing that after so many years. I think you're not. I think you're indirectly telling us we're in deep trouble as a city. Never made such a statement. Never intended such a statement. That's your interpretation, and it's incorrect based on my intent. I'm glad to hear that I'm incorrect. I truly am glad I'm here because hopefully both of us will, will be around long enough to say, Rich. You were dead wrong. I, I, I'm counting on that, but I'm, as I listen to... Just, just let, let yeah. me clarify so it doesn't get mischaracterized. Your statement was, your interpretation of my words was that I was trying to imply or suggest in some fashion that the city was in deep trouble. And that was not the intent of my words, Good and to that's know. not my opinion. Okay. Good to know. I, I feel better already knowing that I'm off track that in the future I probably won't be too concerned <coughs> about pension. I'll have some concerns, but shouldn't be too concerned about uh, the uh, people and their, their working because in my past experience, I found out most bankruptcies were because of health care. That's, I'm just relying on my past sure. experience. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm, I'm trying to formulate my own thoughts. Yeah. And you're telling me I'm off. And, that, and that's good. Yeah, I'm telling you, you're off if you're, if you're reading into my words that the city is in deep trouble. Uh, I, I'm also telling you that pension will always be a serious concern right. for yes. all of us, and health care will always be a serious concern. And it's going to require innovative, uh, reasonable, right. thoughtful planning yes. with each negotiations that we approach. Right. And 3% is probably a good... Uh, salary cap? Well, 
three percent in 2018 in relation to the concessions made by the union and health care I think is a very reasonable settlement okay just as you said the concessions they made on health care yes so there's I think the public needs to understand because I've had some people say hey gee rich three percent is a pretty good raise right what you're saying is because of uh, some of the things that happen in their health care this it balances it. it's always a give and take and let's not forget that with each negotiation particularly large significant bargaining units you set expectations to some degree for the next negotiations right. and what we did with local 251 resembled in many ways with respect to the wage settlement and the health care settlement exactly what we did with the police <coughs> department so to some degree patterns emerge okay. and expectations get set and at the end of the day we have to find a way to get to yes and you don't get to yes by simply demanding concessions and being prepared to give none so it was a balancing act as it always is and if I'm uh, having you think that I, I don't think you worked your, your tail off that's not true because I know anytime you negotiate it's a back and forth no offense taken and it's not it's not meant uh, to be Understood. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, thank you for providing that summary and for walking through the financial aspects of it. I think it's important that people know that we do, in fact, request that information and analyze it. In fact, it wasn't so long ago, 2011, that you mentioned that the City Council was conducting these negotiations before delegating it back to the Mayor. Um, and these analyses are much easier when they don't include pension, which is a much more difficult financial analysis than, than I think what we have before us today with wages and health care, but um, just a few follow-up questions for you. Um, so back in 2011, you mentioned one of our identified challenges in addition to pension was that we had 34 different health care structures and plans. Should this be approved today, how many health care plans are we down to now? Well, let me, let me check them off the list. The, the, the police department, if they're not already there, they will be because they've already agreed to the high deductible health plan. So uh, they're, they're under a plan that's going to be nearly identical to the civilian. So I would count that as, uh, and local 251 civilian bargaining unit, I would count that essentially as one plan because the only difference between the two is the health savings account and how you contribute. Beyond that, we have the functional employee group who's still on the traditional city plan, and they have already uh, signaled to Tim and I in our negotiations that they're willing to move to the high deductible health plan. We are literally at the, uh, at the goal line for finishing these negotiations, and we all expect that one additional meeting will conclude those negotiations. And when they're concluded, I have every confidence that the high deductible health plan identical to Local 251 will be part of the functional employees uh, contract. Then you have the Simtech group. They have not yet begun negotiations, but when they do, they're going to hear the same high deductible health plan contributions. So I'm not going to make any predictions on what happens to the Simtech negotiations because it's too early, but I can assure you we will be setting a very high priority on the high deductible health plan and bringing them under that umbrella. Um, and I expect that will happen uh, through good faith negotiations. Right. Now you talk about the fire department, the other major segment. Um, we negotiated in our last uh, contract with the fire department that they would get, get out from under the city umbrella for health insurance. They're providing their own health insurance as a result of that agreement so we don't worry about that and we don't count them against the the, the notion of one city one plan because we don't have to administer their plan they do it for us the only thing that the city does is make premium contributions to that uh, to that fund and you, you may recall those premium contributions have been frozen since we negotiated their exit from the city plan <clears throat> that's the rank and file uh, fire department um, and I don't expect that health care plan for them will change in their upcoming negotiations. As a, as a matter of fact, we, we will have before the City Council some uh, premium-related uh, 
agreements that we've negotiated with the uh, fire union to keep their health insurance um, their own uh, plan. Mm -hmm. uh, with fire management, they're still on the traditional city plan because we haven't started their negotiations, but we will in, in 2000, early 2019, I would presume, first half of 2019, and when we do, we'll be directing them to the high deductible health plan. So what I'm describing to you, Councilman Festerson, and, and it, it, it's a little bit premature because we've got work to do, um, is a negotiating plan that I believe will result in all city employees, with the exception of rank and file fire department folks who manage their own plan outside of the city under the same high deductible health plan. Thank you, and remind me how retirees um, are in that mix. Well, <laughs> it's complicated, and it's based in part on when those retirees retired. Um, if memory serves, and others were here, and I wasn't when some of these terms came into being, but my recollection is if you retired prior to 2010 or 2011, you're under a previous city health care plan. If you retired after that particular date, and there was a court settlement of which I wasn't involved, um, then they get the same uh, health care plan as active employees. Yeah, that's my recollection too, and I think arguably that's a, uh, an additional plan to the numbers you have, have mentioned, but transitioning towards... Um, that's, that's right. There's the an end date for the retirees yeah. who always transfer into Medicaid when they become Medicaid eligible. Okay. Thank you. And then, uh, Andrew, maybe a question for you um, on the wage side. So um, there is a um, kind of a throwback to 2018, which is the $1.2 million, and the $2.7 million impact in 2019. I want to talk about 2020 because we haven't dealt with that budget yet. But in the 18 and 19 numbers, you're confident that fits within what we have currently budgeted in wage accounts in the 2019 budget? Andrew Broad, City Finance. Andrew Broad, City Finance. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. As Councilman Pauls mentioned, the health care savings don't kick in until 2020 because that's when the plan would go into effect. But there is a significant ramp up time to get something like that done and communicated to employees in, 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 good, fit, in, in good shape. I think the effectiveness of a high deductible plan depends upon that education. So I'm sure you have a plan for that. And um, Tim, you want to address that? Yes, Tim Young, City Human Resources. Uh, that's exactly right. And that's exactly the reason why the police management uh, as we negotiated with them, it's not on the high deductible health plan yet because it kind of happened midstream. So logistically with the payroll department and the various vendors and HSA bank is who use, it's just really difficult to get this going in the, in the middle of the calendar year. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to take your time to, to ramp it up and do it right. right. And give employees notice on how, how their health care will change or how the plan will change at least. Yes, and we've already been rolling out the educational pieces uh, at every step of the way. Okay, thank you. And I don't think there's a representative of 251 here um, that I see, but um, can you characterize their vote on this? Was it a large majority of members that voted in favor of this? I wouldn't say that it's a large majority. Uh, I, I want to say there was maybe a 70 to 80 member difference. So 70 to 80 on the plus side. Mm -hmm. they, they seem very happy. Those that I spoke to seem very happy about the, uh, the fact that the city is willing to uh, reduce the out-of-pocket exposures. Okay, thank you. And then, Mark, you answered kind of my last question, I think, already, but the remaining entities that do currently do not have a contract and the status of them, so it sounds like you're making good progress with functionals. Very much so. And, but Semtech has not quite, has not started. Correct. Okay. And they've been without a contract since 2018 as well, right? Correct. They've been, they've been invited to start, and they haven't been receptive to that. And frankly, uh, we decided that we would prioritize Local 251 and the functionals following Local 251 so that we could go back to Simtech and uh, demonstrate to them the wisdom of moving to a high deductible health plan as well as uh, the other terms that we're negotiating with the other civilian bargaining units. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Palermo. Thank you, Mr. President. I guess that was one of my questions, too. I was going to ask you if you're privy to the number uh, based on 251 and they're voting on this contract. But obviously it was approved because it's in front of us on the agenda. 
to vote on it in a couple of weeks, so they must have reached an agreement. Uh, having paid union dues into Local 251, I know that uh, in this bargaining process, there is a lot of give and take, and it's not easy. Uh, people's feelings get hurt. Uh, you got different jobs that, uh, like you had said, the, you did the wage study on 21 jobs. So that was a question I had besides the numbers, but like I said, it, it got a, approved, so that's why it's in front of us. So them 21 jobs that didn't qualify for the 3%, some were below and some were above. Do you know what them exact numbers were? What the exact percentage? No, is? like on the wage study, how many fell below the 3% and how many went above the 3%? Most above, so especially, above. In, in, especially in year one. And it, you know, it's kind of all over the board and, and we provided that data once before to the city council. I know it's been several weeks, but I, you know, I've got an exhibit which lists each job classification. It gets kind of complicated because with, with, with each of those 21 job classifications, we negotiated a specific change to the minimum rate in that job classification and a specific change to the maximum rate in that job classification, each with, with three years. So 21 times three, you've got essentially 60 some variations in, in wage increases between the first year of the contract and the third year of the contract. But most of them, especially in the first year, were higher than 3%. And most of them after the first year were lower than 3%. So, so if I had to generalize, uh, the, the second and third year increases for most of those are in the neighborhood of 2%. But they, you know, there's some you know, 5% here or there. And there's, I mentioned earlier, one classification received a 10% increase in the first year of the contract because they were so low versus the market. I'm not trying to avoid your question. I'm simply trying to say it's complicated because there's so many vari variations within those 21 job classifications. Sure. Thank you for that. And I know uh, Mr. Young and I have spoke a couple times about certain job classifications that we're having trouble finding employees. And uh, I know there was a couple times I was going to ask you that question. I never did. You don't have to go into it today unless you really want to. No, I, okay. I have no intention of going into Good. it. But I Good. just want to remind you and the, uh, the rest of the council that, you know, in addition to the positions that were identified in the wage study that was produced by 251, there were uh, a couple of positions that I threw into the mix because of the difficulty in recruiting uh, and getting people to fill these important positions. Sure, and I, I would agree 100%, so thank you. Thank you. Um, there are no more lights. Next item. Item 8080, an ordinance to approve the fiscal year 2018 criminal and juvenile justice and mental health collaboration program grant award in the amount of $690,240 during the project period of January 1, 2019 to December 31st, 2021. Public hearing agenda item number 80 is today. Proponents, please. Hi, I'm Shana Ray. I'm the Crisis Intervention Team Coordinator for Lutheran Family Services, 120 South 24th. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Luis Jimenez, 518 North 40th Street. Uh, council members, this morning I attended a commissioner's meeting where they spoke about juvenile mental health, which are the same people that you guys are dealing with. It's the same young kids. You guys deal with them. You got two different governmental bodies dealing with the same people. The commissioners want to spend $120 million for a juvenile justice center, which would involve mental health uh, programs for the juvenile offenders in the, in the for future development. Those, they don't have these programs. So it's encouraging that the city is also developing programs for uh, mental health for the young kids. Uh, but I saw this amount and I think is wholly uh, inadequate for what needs to happen for mental health for the kids here in Douglas County and in Omaha. Uh, the issue with the juvenile justice uh, detention center for the kids will be coming to your attention if it hasn't already. And 
I hope that you consider programming part of your consideration on, on many, many of these details. And the price for this is now at $140 million for the new uh, Justice Center, which includes a detention center downtown for the kids. I hope you support a lower cost for this program, a savings. Commissioner Kavanaugh has provided an alternative to this plan. And he talks about saving $24 million by going with an alternative plan. $24 million, taxpayer money, that can be used for mental health for the kids. $24 million. That's a lot for programming that you can do. Consider that, please, because it is going to impact the future, not just um, present decision-making, policy-making, but people's lives. Think about how much more funds can be put to mental health for the juvenile offenders. Thank you. I just wanted, want you to keep in mind, though, that this is a grant. So this is not anything that's coming out of this. is a grant. I understand that, but okay. we're talking about All right, I just wanted to make sure you understood mental health a grant. Yeah, but, I, but making, you were saying I'm, I'm making us put more note. money in it. We didn't put any money. This is a grant. I'm asking you to listen to what I'm saying. Thank you. You know, they're going to get tired of messing with me. I'm, I'm going to be that, uh, that other person you keep on. Go ahead, Mr. Sorsden. Anybody Hello. else in opposition? Hello again. My name is Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue. <clears throat> I've got at least five people behind me here that are uh, maybe my opponents. And I want to thank all of you and them for being concerned, uh, being interested in youth. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, as good a proponent as you are, perhaps you don't listen enough. My point being, look in this room. Are there any youth here? Are there any youth with mental health problems here? Are there any juveniles that are detained here? Do we read any of their testimony? Is any of it presented? Probably not, because somebody else writes down what they think those kids say and then makes a decision that, well, they're either a behavior problem or they're a mental health problem, et cetera. And maybe they're in detention, maybe they're not. A lot of that's discussed lately, but nobody really says why they're in detention. Uh, technically, we shouldn't be detaining any juveniles unless they committed a crime of some sort. So anyway, what I'm here is to say, please open your ears to people other than the people that write the best practices. They, like you, are so busy that they probably never talk to the kids that they're writing about. Mr. Gray is all for the youth, so am I. But I can tell you from personal experience with a close relative that until I got rather vocal at about the third grade level, he didn't get special education. After that, yes, he did, but it was all based on a budget and based on behavior. Nobody ever wanted to find out, did he fall and hit his head somewhere along the line? Did he have PTSD? Did he have a brain injury or a brain malformation? Nobody ever asked that, even the professionals. At least three times, emergency commitment to a hospital. And those professionals never wanted to ask Anybody other than the mother, maybe. They never really asked the child. They never asked for input from a grandparent that knows him better than they do. They can probably say, well, I'm sorry, but I did force the issue one time, and we found out 
that it was not just behavior, that he in fact was missing a part of the brain. That's the middle section. And that causes a, a problem with processing, like with PTSD. Somebody falls and hits their head, or just the other day another pedestrian hit by a car, hit their head on the sidewalk and has severe problems. And I know a person that has recovered from that. Maybe not, <coughs> but it shakes the brain up. Now we want police officers driving around to maybe help pick up people that we think, or even juveniles, and take them in for assessment, detain them and assess them, without, even without a parent's permission. So part of the problem is the privacy laws. Now, if you carefully read the federal privacy laws, they never intended for people to shut people like me out. They also intended for the person, the patient, to be able to say who's on his team. They didn't intend for that person to be shut out. But does anybody really ask the, the youth who they want on their team? Does anybody really approve that? Nobody ever really asked me. And when I tried to give information, they didn't want it. When I tried to tell them I paid for an MRI and I know what the results are, let's discuss it. They said, no, not interested. I'm the professional. I know. They didn't go to uh, conventions talking about autism and brain disorders, disorders of the corpus callosum specifically. People that have that problem, patients that have that problem. The Rain Man was there. I had a private supper with him and his father, just us. He knew Omaha streets. He read the phone book. He might have read two phone books at a time. Yes, he had a brain injury, but he was capable of things. Tipple Grandin had brain, brain missing formation, but was capable. And she has a PTSD. I have a, I have a question. So but, what I'm but saying Mr. is, Mr. Shore, what is that? And I just want to know, for as as an opponent, what does that have, have to do with grant. this grant? Okay. I'm sorry, Amy. If you could, just I'll, tell me I'll what has to do with the grant. Okay. Thank you. We have a grant, yes, but that doesn't mean it's going to solve any problems. Okay. Okay. Think about those privacy laws, and it'll allow people like me to help give you solutions. You can't solve it without input. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I'm, I'm very supportive of this work, and I'm pleased to see the team come down to talk about this a little bit, because I think it's, it is important to highlight the efforts they are going to, to address what I think is one of the most important issues in our community right now, and one of our biggest challenges that's impacting literally everything when we talk about law enforcement, jails, um, schools, emergency rooms, um, when you ask almost any superintendent uh, in the metro area what some of their biggest challenges are, in the top two is mental health. And I know that's a big concern of our police chief, and I know he's very attuned to that, and so I think it is appropriate we have a couple of items in our legislative package that do address mental health, because we all need to be a part of that answer. So I had a few just follow-up questions, I think, for Captain Ray. Welcome back. Well, thank you. <laughs> I actually didn't realize that you were the the uh, coordinator of this program, but I'm pleased to see it because you were very effective um, working on the police uh, force for us and in the Northwest Precinct, and I know you understand that work as well. So um, a few things I want to I want to ask you about or have you summarize um, about the grant is it's, it's a $690,000 um, grant. That's uh, correct. Federal grant through the state. Is that correct? Just federal, the, the mayor's office is the one who facilitated that for us. Uh-huh, okay. And then it's matched by some local funding through the Community Foundation and Metro Community College That's and right. numerous partners that are involved in this work. Two of the main things it does, uh, we'll establish the full-time position through Lutheran Family Services, um, which is the full-time coordinator of a crisis intervention team, and then some co-responders within our police department precincts. Do you want to talk about that work a little bit? Well, I'm currently the crisis intervention team tr coordinator, and uh, my job is part-time. Okay. Uh, we have a huge need. There's a lot of officers we have on waiting lists. We, they want more training. We've extended the training to a lot of agencies outside of Omaha that wouldn't normally get that training um, that we have in some of the bigger cities. So 
we'll offer to bring some of those smaller agencies in. And it's a basically a 40-hour class for law enforcement to get them certified, get them some skills and tools on how to look at mental illnesses as a possibility rather than just throw them in jail. Um, let's try to get them some resources. Now, we're also looking at crisis response team people who will be embedded with the police department. And I'll have Lindsay Kroll, who is one of my coworkers. She deals with the crisis response. Hi, Lindsay Kroll, Food and Family Services, 2661 Douglas Street. Um, <clears throat> the co-responder model is a therapist, so a clinician embedded within the police department. So actually housed in the precinct with officers, sitting alongside sergeants, listening to police radios. Um, so listening to 911 calls that come in through the CAT system and going out alongside officers and responding as a team, so providing the right intervention at the right time for those calls that have a behavioral health component to them in order to divert from hospitalization, incarceration, and really getting people access to resources that they may not have known how to access before. And how many of those will we have? Currently, we have 1.5 uh, 1 FTEs, and this grant would include another full-time co-responder. Okay. So there's not one per each precinct, but how, how does the workload work? Is it uh, by shift, or how do, you, how do you share that load? So part of this current grant, we're also going to be looking at some behavioral health tracking to help us really identify those needs in certain areas that may have more behavioral health-related calls and the, kinds of, like the times of day when those calls are coming in so we can better staff that for the co-responder to be available. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and then as I understand the grant, um, those, this will increase the number of crisis intervention team trainings, uh, I think one more session, so an additional 40 officers most likely? Well, we'll have one more. Uh, in 2019, we'll go with our standard three that we do now. And keep in mind, we've been doing this since 2006, so we do three trainings a year. 2020 will be four, and then 2021 will be five. And I have no doubt we will easily fill those. Okay. And also some refresher courses for those that have currently been trained, right? That's correct. On December 12th, currently, for example, we have a youth CIT, so it's specifically directed on how officers can deal with youth and their current brain development. Um, we are looking at having some ongoing refresher course training, some specialization training for those officers. And then in addition of what looks to be suicide specific training too? That's correct. We, uh, I have a calendar up here that has all of our 40 hour training if you're interested in seeing it, but it's, it's adolescents, adults, suicide, Alzheimer's, um, uh, what's the developmental disabilities. It really, I mean, 40 hours is, a good amount of time, but there's it's just an ongoing educational experience to be proficient at mm -hmm. dealing with the issue. And can you estimate for us what percentage of our police force you think has been trained or has some training at this point? One third of our officers have been trained. Um, I wrote it on my hands. 271 officers currently that are employed with Omaha Police Department. We've had a lot of them retire, and so we want to get it is a voluntary training we want everyone to be there who has a great intent and want to learn and be a positive part so uh, we would love to have everyone but we want to make sure that it's a voluntary thing and that they're willing to open their mind and be willing good i'll help more take advantage of that because i think it is one of the biggest challenges they face day to day and and do have that burden of sometimes being the first responder uh, to yes. issues like this and i think we greatly benefit by um having those trained um, embedded in these precincts or along these patrols to help them with situations they encounter and sometimes don't have the time to encounter so that we don't experience the revolving door of jails and law enforcement and emergency rooms that I think currently, currently does happen. And I agree with some of the testimony, other testimonies today too that um, if anything additional resources is needed in this mm -hmm. area um, on many different fronts. So along, that, along those lines, my last question to you is, um, what would you like to be doing uh, that you aren't currently able to do with this amount of resources? I would like to have, well, I don't know if I'm the expert, but uh, um, I would like to have more mental health resources. Uh, there's just never enough. And specifically in the, with the juvenile, um, when we have experts come in who work with juveniles to train us, 
they'll, it's really a limited number. So I'll let Lindsay speak. Um, <clears throat> I would agree with what Shana said, but then also looking at embedding more corresponders, so having one for each precinct um, to really be a collaborative response paired with a CIT trained officer in a, in a big picture world, that would be ideal having a specialized team with a therapist and a CIT trained officer responding to behavioral health related calls to free up officer time to respond to other types of calls that may be coming in for service so they're a little bit more specialized in how to respond and assist those folks. Mm -hmm. And possibly a dedicated funding stream to be able to do that, I presume, right? Yes, that's correct. But something I'd be interested in pursuing with you, um, you know, in the next budget process or however that would work. I think that's um, one of the most important things we can be doing. When one in seven families are facing these crises, these crises uh, in Nebraska every day, I think it's, it should be a high priority for us. So thank, thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Mr. Ms. Melton. Thank you. And Captain Ray, I just wanted to say thank you for your continued work for our community <laughs> after your retirement. Oh, thank so you. So I wasn't pleasure. aware that this is what you were doing. I was wondering when I saw you there. I'm like, which one of these things is she <laughs> getting up on? But thank you for your continued work because you actually – I think you bring a lot to the program because you understand what it was like being an officer, being a captain and over the yeah. officers, and now being able to help. And I wish I would have had this training. This training was uh, tough to get into. And now that I've gone through this training after I've retired, I just sit there and think, oh, there's so many ways that I would have handled things differently if I would have had that training and just thought about you know, that person in a different way. And, and I do, and I wanted to just kind of make sure, and I, I think Councilman Festerson went over it, but what exactly the Heartland Crisis Intervention Team actually does, because I think the people that were opponents were not thinking that it had something to do with the Juvenile Justice Center or, or something else. This is yeah. the crisis response team for persons that maybe we believe from the 911 call or have an illness. Could you just well, explain that or how that works? Our crisis intervention team training is for officers, law enforcement officers. And it teaches them about resources, it educates them on the different issues, the mental health issues, the developmental uh, disabilities issues. Um, we have a lot of people who come in who are dealing with these issues or are family members, and it's amazing. You can hear a pin drop in the training. It's some uh, really powerful training. Now, when people call 911, they can ask specifically for a crisis intervention trained officer and hope you'll put a broadcast out, CIT officer needed at this address. And so the officers who are certified just have a few more tools maybe than the average officer, but a lot of the officers are learning through the others who are going on these calls. Now, the well, crisis- do we have enough officers that, I mean, is that, Maybe the thing where maybe we need to get 911 people trained That's as well correct. so yeah. that you don't necessarily, you might not, the normal, mm -hmm. the average caller, the mom or I mean, whoever else might right. not know they need a CIT. Right, and we're trying to spread that word that they can ask for that CIT officer. Okay. Um, part of the training also is part of our expansion plan is uh, we, we have a lot of interest from 911 dispatchers, uh, firefighters, people who work in emergency rooms, we do train um, security officers at the local hospitals. It's, uh, there's definitely a huge need. And then the CIT officers, um, well, all officers know that they can call for crisis response team person, those therapists that are embedded in the police department. But the crisis intervention team officers, there's more of them. It's uh, more of a you know, we don't have those degrees. We just have that 40 hour training plus the additional training that we get in the academy and the ongoing training we choose. So if I, and I wanna kind of piggyback a little bit on what Council Festerson just said, really if we could get more training and then advanced, potentially advanced training for maybe some of the, that 30% that have it, but then get them some advanced training. Right, the more the better. So more it training, would be the more, more training that we could get. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and that, this this is a good start. This grant with the six hundred thousand. Oh, um, definitely. But and if we, we could to... get more grants or more yeah. funding or prioritize that more in our next budget, maybe that's yeah. something we need to look at. This this has been a program since two thousand six, and it has to be sustainable. Um, you know, we all see the need there, and it's growing. And w with more education, we understand that we need it even more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you all. No more lights. The next item. Item 81, an ordinance to amend section three of ordinance number 41152 adopted May 16th, 2017 to change the effective date for applications under the Nebraska Property Assessed Clean Energy Act program. Public hearing agenda item number 81 is today. Proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the council, Kevin Anderson with the mayor's office. Um, here to uh, really introduce uh, the PACE amendment ordinance provides clarifying language that really marries the effective date of the ordinance to uh, the state's enabling legislation provides more clarity for the committee moving forward. Um, PACE is a, a, a allowing a really third party financing of energy efficiency improvements with uh, energy efficiency and efficient use of resources being a, a public benefit, but it also has a, a kind of side benefit uh, selfishly for providing a, a pretty effective economic development tool. Uh, so that's why I'm here speaking in, in as a proponent for the amendment language. So I'll stick around for any questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Ms. Shelton, did you have your light on? No, you did. Right. Okay, that was last time. Okay, uh, next item. Item 82, Lucy Frank's appeal for the denial of her certificate of approval by the Landmarks Heritage Preservation Committee. Public hearing on agenda item number 82 is today. Proponents, please. Your Honor, Lawrence Whalen, 3138, uh, Cumming Street, appearing on behalf of uh, Lucy Frank's uh, counsel, Mr. President. Um, did you guys get the handout we had with the application on it as well as the, um, the yes. email? Okay. Um, I, I do want to direct your attention uh, not only to the app, that application, but also to the um, city planning recommendation report that was dated July 11th of 2018 that's a three-page document and on the second page of that document under conclusions about uh, it's the second paragraph under conclusions about the middle of the paragraph the planning department indicated and I quote the profile and dimensions of the new windows are compatible with the overall appearance of the remainder of the house since no new storm windows have been applied it can be argued that the appearance of the front facade has been improved and offers, offers a more historic character. Double, double hung windows without applied storm windows reveal more depth to the window frame sash arrangement. Um, then the planning department went on and made recommendations with respect to it, but allow her to continue to have the, the windows uh, in place. Um, what we're I've known, you know, I'm a neighbor of Lucy's, okay, I, and so I know her, uh, and there's some assertions or concerns throughout this whole process that she somehow tried to, um, you know, she ignored the recommendations, the restrictions on windows, um, and that's just not true. Uh, the city department, or planning department, sent out a letter apparently in, I think it was June or July of 2017 that had the window restrictions. Well, I live in that neighborhood. I live four houses just west of Lucy, and I don't remember ever receiving that either. I'm also a member of Bemis Neighborhood Association, and those things were never discussed. Um, the first I became aware of it, and then Lucy indicates she became aware of it, any sort of window restrictions was when there, uh, there was a house that was being sold you know, for profit, it was being flipped, they put about $200,000 into the house um, right on Hawthorne Ave, and they were trying to upgrade their windows to double hung windows. And that was when there were some people contesting it at that time. And this was just six months ago that that took place. And it was at that time that most of the people in the neighborhood became aware that there are window restrictions with historic neighborhoods. Well, that's when she became aware of it as well. That was already after Anderson Windows put these windows in uh, from, what was it, November of 2017 through March. She then found out about this, then made the application, uh, and so she's trying to do everything she could to comply. Um, I think, so that's, that's concerning to me that, that there's some assertions that she knew all about this and she just didn't, I mean, neither did I. Um, the, uh, with respect to, the the windows themselves if you look at the pictures they're upgraded windows they're high efficiency windows and they 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 make the whole house look much better uh, I 
I'm not sure why the Historic Preservation um, Department denied the application with respect to her. Uh, as indicated in the email, she was trying to work with the City Planning Department to find a resolution uh, to the problem, and it just it didn't happen, and th therefore the appeal took place. What we're asking uh, um, the council is to allow her to appeal, go forward with the appeal, so that she can um, have a resolution to this matter. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Um, I would like to speak. Uh, Hannah Solberg, I live at 7731 Hamilton Street. Um, I am here to support Lucy Franks and her appeal. I recognize that a building permit was not sought and work was done on the windows. Over time, this case has escalated to a city council meeting and here we are. <coughs> I would like the committee to consider that Ms. Franks has the historic and neighborhood integrity in mind. These 1960s screen windows were not safe, lacked energy efficiency, and did not match the rest of the house, nor were they historic. Um, the work done on 3411 Hawthorne has drastically improved the appeal and look of the house. Um, <coughs> uh, Lucy's counsel just quoted the exact quote that I had written down, so I'm not going to repeat that to you. But I will say that in that report, to me, that says that um, the windows were satisfactory. In addition, 3411 was recently featured on a historic home tour through Restoration Exchange. If the removal of the three original windows represented such an issue, why was 3411 featured? The house clearly met the historic design needs of Restoration Exchange. The greater Omaha area is known for urban sprawl. Our city center is hit or miss with neighborhoods that are taken care of. As a social worker, I've been all over the city of Omaha and seen how poverty and home disrepair can impact an area. In fact, when Mrs. Franks bought the house, all the copper pipes had been cut out and weekly homeless individuals do approach her house for resources. Uh, it is critical that the Bemis Park area that we have urban infill and homeowners that take care of their properties like Mrs. Franks. She's doing what she can. She is truly improving the home. Therefore, I ask that you keep the bigger picture in mind and allow Mrs. Franks and the LHPC to come back to the table uh, and to craft a compromise, one that is fair and financially fair for the homeowner and satisfies the needs of the LHPC. Thank you. Thank you. Any other proponents who wish to be heard? I'm Lucy Franks. I'm the homeowner at 3411, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Fellow Thank you. Brian Wanzenried, 5205 Cass Street. I'm the uh, father of two of, the, of Lucy Frank's three grandchildren, and I'm also a professional licensed environmental engineer. And uh, one of my concerns with these old homes and these windows is the, what a lot of people don't know is, is when you open and close these windows when you can, uh, that causes uh, the paint that often has lead in it to become airborne. And that's one of the higher uh, causes of people to become, children especially, to become exposed to lead-based paint. Also, in my career, I've also, uh, well, as a child, I grew up in one of these older homes, and I was always having to be the only one strong enough to open a number of the windows, and it, sometimes it would depend on the day when the weather was bad or humid. We couldn't open the window because those older windows swell. Uh, as I grew up and started designing things in my career for the life safety code, I realized what a hazard this is. Uh, if you can't open a window safely, you can't escape a burning building safely. And so these are a couple things I thought were important things that I didn't think were brought up previously, but I think are very important factors, and, and they should allow uh, Mrs. Franks to go back to the planning board and get reconsideration. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? <coughs> Seeing none, are there any opponents who wish to be heard? <coughs> Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Mr. I'm sorry. Opponent? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, my name is Mary Minturn. I'm a resident property owner in the Bemis Park Landmarks, Landmarks Heritage Preservation District at 3416 Hawthorne Avenue. And I just want to clarify that there were two sets of windows put in. The original windows, I think they said, were put in in November. 
of 2017 and nobody opposed those windows. They were not uh, replacing historic windows. They were on an enclosed porch, which would have never been enclosed before. The second set of windows was placed in April of 2018 and those were on the house proper and there were a total of four windows replaced. Um, and then the rest I'm gonna read here. Um, uh, I'm here today to ask the city council to deny this appeal based on number one, the lack of process followed by the applicant, number two, my support for historic preservation, and number three, the destructive precedent that would be set for all HPDs in the city if this appeal is approved. While I do acknowledge that there has been a lack of communication from home sellers and real estate agents to buyers in the district, I believe that Ms. Franks knew or should have known that her property lies within a landmarks district and that certain processes needed to be followed when making changes to the house, such as replacing historic windows. Um, she had claimed at the commission hearing and again today that she did not know. The reasons that I think she knew are that number one, a letter was sent from the planning department to all addresses in the district in June of 2017 as a reminder to property owners of this responsibility. Number two, from about September 2017 to January 2018, there was an application before the Landmarks Commission for window replacement at 3515 Hawthorne Avenue, just a block and a half west of Ms. Frank's, Frank's property. This application was the subject of much discussion in the neighborhood and at neighborhood association meetings. As a board member for the association, Ms. Franks was present at at least two meetings where I and another property owner in the district provided education on the significance of the LHPD designation and working with the Planning Department and Landmarks Commission. Education and information was also posted on the Neighborhood Association Facebook page and on nextdoor.com where Ms. Franks has posted her profile. She was also copied on emails providing information. The neighborhood newsletter printed statements about the application and finally notice of its denial in March of 2018. Ms. Franks replaced uh, her historic windows on the house proper in April of 2018 without obtaining the required city permit or application for approval. I think her actions were an attempt to uh, circumvent the approval pro process and frankly showed a lack of respect uh, or lack of regard for the law, other property owners in the district and for the important work of the Landmarks Commission. The City Council members have been provided with copies of petitions circulated to property owners in the Bemis Park Landmarks District in January of 2018. Of those that participated, 23 supported preservation standards and six were against for uh, approximately 79% in support. And that was with, we had to disregard several, several households where there were absentee landlords and you have the list of that in the petition. I have found the application for approval process is not difficult and that staff uh, with the city is very helpful and without unrealistic expectations. They could have shown Ms. Franks that broken rope pulleys and paint on historic windows are easily remedied and that these windows are worthy of preservation to maintain the historic value of the house. I ask the council not to set a precedent that will affect, affect all landmarks districts in Omaha and to please deny this appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard? Good afternoon. My name is Johnny Fogarty. I live in an historic house at uh, the corner of 38th and California, 521 North 38th Street. I am currently the president of the Landmarks Heritage Preservation Commission. And just want to talk a little bit, uh, inform you a little bit about this specific historic district. Bemis Park neighborhood is, it's one of the oldest and most important historic districts in our city. Um, it, if you can, if any of you are old enough like I am to remember the 70s and the 80s, it went through a terrible time where there was a flight out of the neighborhood and uh, um, there was um, a lot of rental homes, there were fraternity houses, there were drug houses, 
a lot of problems and a lot of vacant houses and the people that live there made a huge effort to bring this area back and it is coming back and I think it will end up as things progress as probably one of the best historic districts in the state of Nebraska. There's been a real rebirth of the neighborhood and this is not in the last year or so this is not the only household that has become come before the Commission regarding windows. It's um, a very important aspect of the historic of a historic house and mostly we uh, have found people absolutely compliant and wanting to do the right thing. The Preservation Commission is familiar with the district. I want you to know that we don't just read about houses. We get out and we look at them. We have an excellent commission right now. Most of our architects are like myself, historians, Omaha historians. And they know this district. They know how old it is, how far it goes back, the important people that live there. And um, they, uh, the residents comply. They want to elevate their neighborhood. They want it to continue uh, improving. And to, do, and to do that, you have to be historic. The commission itself, they've gone out there in snowstorms in the winter and they've looked at properties. Um, they are very accurate and very good in their decision making. Any questions? Thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish to be heard? <clears throat> Seeing that public hearing is closed, Mr. Jaron. Yes, Mr. Moult. Jed Moulton, Planning Department. Could you take a minute to explain the appeal as it relates to the porch and to the house and how many windows total and how many are on the house itself versus sure. the porch? Because uh, I've heard three on the house, four yeah. on the house. The there appears to be some confusion on the matter, but generally speaking, there's two groups of windows. The majority of the windows, I believe, is 14. Uh, our new thermal windows are applied to a porch. Previous windows are storm windows um, and were not historic in and of themselves. And much of the porch has been altered over time where it, it doesn't represent its historic um, original condition either. Was it a part of the application though? It was. It's a part of the appeal? It, it is. Okay, so now let's get to the house. Yes. Can we get resolution on whether there are three windows or four? Well, um, my my understanding is it was three windows, but Mary may understand differently. I thought it was three windows in the front. Four on the front elevation? One one on, the side. on the side. Which okay. side? So I, I'm in Miss East. Okay, yeah. so three on the. There's four in the principal house and 14 on the porch. Okay. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. The way I look at this is uh, one of perspective, anyway, anecdotally, that. One, I would say, of the heartburn issues for people in other historic districts that have come to my attention that I hear about is when people do things without a permit and then um, something happens, whether it be a fence, a remodeling, and the people who do comply and take such pride in, in ownership who were aware of the rules, and I'm not saying that you did, and, and, and ignore them. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying we are where we are. But one of the things that I hear a lot about most recently in the North Gold Coast was, hey, you know, I fixed up my house and I played by the rules and, and come over and look at what happened next door to me. And now the planning department's like, well, there's nothing we can do. And whether well, that's true or not, I don't know, but that's the sense that the people who were asking me to come out and see them. So I take a strict view on these, is that if we have a code, the code's to be followed, and what is the intent of the code? 
And as laid out in this case, I don't feel and, and believe, and I don't think the planning department does, that your porch is something that falls within the purview of, of what the Landmarks Heritage Preservation Commission and our codes in that regard are trying to protect. So I think that the appeal on that part of your case has merit, but I'm inclined to take a strict view on the preservation and defense of the code and enforcement with regard to the house itself with the three windows on the one elevation and the, and the one on the other. So what I would like to see happen is to, um, if we could city legal, grant that part of appeal going to the porch, deny the, the, the rest of the appeal for the four windows on the structure of the house itself, refer the matter back to the Landmarks Heritage Commission and the Planning Department for review and approval of an appropriate window for the house for the four replacements. Yeah, uh, and Paul Kratz, City Attorney, that would be an appropriate uh, motion to make, if you so moved. desire. Moved and seconded. Um, Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm sympathetic to the practical concerns that we're trying to be addressed with the windows and certainly the concern about lead paint and, and insulation. But I, I agree that um, we do need to take our historic status seriously in these neighborhoods that have worked so hard to get it. And that only works if everyone is following the same rules and those rules are enforced. But in this case, I am interested in the compromise that Mr. Jerem just described because when it comes down to essentially three windows or four windows, I guess we're talking about, as opposed to the porch, um, which I don't think sounds like is of great concern. It seems to me that's a pretty workable compromise that maintains historic status, but also doesn't um, negatively impact <coughs> practicality what you're trying to do and I think the financial impact of trying to reverse that situation uh, would be um, not a barrier either so I think how we facilitate that compromise and that solution is through the motion that um, Mr. Jerem um, just made and was that seconded? It was seconded um, by Mr. 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 Harding. I'll, yes. I'll be supporting that too. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harding. Thank you Mr. President. Just wanted to um, I, I think I heard too one of the proponents, I think it was uh, Ms. Solberg, um, had even mentioned something about a compromise, but I think the way she said it was grant us the appeal and that, so we can get to a compromise. But I, I think the, the direction that Mr. Jerem has, has set this on is, is the appropriate way to get to that compromise. And reading through the, the case um, and understanding through Mr. Moulton and, and others that the porch is not of concern as it relates to the uh, what would be considered historic it just relates to the windows so that's why I'm supporting this compromise thank you and just to clarify the yes vote if it were a yes vote it would be to uh, it would be uh, denying the, the house but uh, supporting the porch correct that's okay. what I've written down yes. okay thank you uh, there are no more lights roll call Jerem yes Melton yes. Pauls Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Item 128, a resolution to approve the easement and construction agreement with Union Pacific Railroad in the amount of $29,120 for the 26 and Q Street Bridge replacement project. Public hearing agenda item number 89, is it? 128. 128 is today. Are there any proponents? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Non-action items, items 83 through 126 do not require public hearing or city council consideration at this meeting, but will be placed on a future agenda for public hearing and or vote. The reason for non-action is noted after the item on the agenda, as well as the date the item is expected to appear on the agenda for consideration. Motion Second, roll call. Jerem. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Harding. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Mr. President. And happy Thanksgiving to everyone, and yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Meeting is adjourned, 4.52 p.m.